folks. We will call our meeting to order. And first, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq and the district of Sabag and Agate, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Next, we will have our moment of silent contemplation. Next, I would be looking for the approval of or amendments to the agenda. So moved. moved by Councillor Hibbs, seconded by Councillor Musa. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary? Motion is carried. Next, we'll look for the approval of the minutes of May 9th, 2023 regular meeting of Council for Policy and May 17th, 2023 regular meeting of Council. So moved. Second. moved by Councillor Mitchell, seconded by Councillor Tingley. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary? Motion is carried. Next, we'll move along to correspondence for information. Does any, Councillor Tingley? Uh, yes, I just want to uh, ask about the uh, the letter <coughs> that some residents received from CCRC about uh, canceling the the bus uh, service for elementary children uh, in September. Um, all the councillors would have received a, a copy of that, I assume. And I'm not sure how many councillors have heard from residents, but I've heard from one resident, but I'm aware that there's a lot of talk in, the, in, in my district about it. Um, so I'm just wondering if we could set up some kind of a meeting with CCRCE to uh, determine what, what, is, what they're doing here, why they never communicated any of this with, uh, with the municipality. Uh, I know, uh, the resident that contacted me said they were advised by one of the principals that uh, the municipality would be required to install uh, sidewalks and crosswalks and, and uh, uh, cross guards uh, if th those are required. <coughs> and in some cases, at least a, a cross guard probably would be required if they uh, have to walk to school. Like, one of the areas would be through the Lance Roundabout. That wouldn't be a, an easy location to navigate for uh, primary and grade one kids in the, in the morning uh, during rush hour. Uh, so I'm just wondering if we could set up a meeting with CCRCE and find out what their plan is here. Uh, you know, do, do they expect this to create a hazard for for the children that are going to school? And uh, what is what is the plan to, to deal with uh, any risks? Uh, do they expect the municipality uh, to do anything here? Uh, and, and why why we weren't communicated in, with in advance? If I could, this is a topic that uh, it's been around for a while. It's uh, around in the rural area. <clears throat> It's been an ongoing issue in my area as well, but the uh, decision to remove busing service that was always offered in the past, it's not an area of municipal jurisdiction. Um, and we have zero input on it. I have spoken with the MLA about it, and uh, he says he has been told quite clearly by CCRCE that it's an operational matter, and as such, there is no room for input even from the MLA. So um, I think a meeting uh, might be interesting if they'd come. I would go a step further and suggest that we ask the Minister of Education to come. Uh, just my comments. Anyone else on this issue? Anything else right now, Councillor? Well, I just have a number of questions, but I'd be interested to see what the other councillors if they've heard about this or what they have to say. 
Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Madam Warden um, and, and Chair. Uh, so the reason why they wouldn't have contacted the municipality um, about this is because it, it isn't a municipal uh, area. Um, we, we aren't expected to do it. You know, they're not expected to put up sidewalks or crosswalks or this is just an age old, decades old uh, rule, policy that they've had in that they are only now starting to um, enact. Uh, it used to be anyone from 1.6 kilometers and less who was bused, that was considered courtesy busing. Buses would be going by anyway, so they, so they would pick up the kids. Um, and as far as, uh, as them changing it now, it's because we're in a crisis for bus drivers. So they're trying to uh, get more, more kids that they mandatorily have to drive on buses. Uh, once August 24th comes, any uh, spaces on buses that are deemed surplus, um, there will be a um, application process to go through, and that will start with pre-primary age children <coughs> filling the spots. But from what I'm told, uh, there will be very, very few spots because there's going to be less buses. Um, it's, they're trying to respond to the, uh, to the crisis, or however you want to, to call it, um, with busing these days. I mean... Who would have ever thought 10, five years ago that um, you know you would have certain days during the week where buses would not be running in certain rural areas 10 kilometers from the, from the schools, not close to the schools. You'll, it'll just say the yellow bus will not be running on Tuesday. And everybody who travels on the yellow bus, no matter how far or how close to the school, will be responsible for finding their own drive to and from school on that day. So that's how they've been trying to deal with the uh, bus busing issue this year, but this is a uh, this is an effort to try and deal with it on a more permanent basis. And I mean, that roundabout in Lance is probably a unique situation in CCRCE for children four years and up having to walk to school through that roundabout. I mean, cars are having trouble navigating that roundabout. I go through that on my bicycle and I'm all, you know, I have to have my wits about me. So for little kids to be walking through it, it just is really unrealistic, but yet this is their policy and they're, they're deciding that they need to, to uh, enforce it at this point. So that's just a little information about it. Thank you. Councillor Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Madam Ward. Just as a follow-up to the discussion, the emails that I've received is that parents are gonna have a find it difficult to drop their kids off uh, or take their kids, drive their kids to school and also get to work on time. And with the pre-primary programs, some of the parents are going to have to pull their children out of the pre-primary program because they have problems with connections with daycare, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's uh, important that we uh, convey, convey to the CCRCE that of those issues, even though the parents are sending those comments forward that we as council think that this should be revisited and maybe in late August, they'll decide that uh, there will be enough busing and courtesy busing will continue. In my subdivision, I assume all of my pre-primary and elementary school children will have to walk and there's no sidewalks and, and my big concern is a safety factor, especially if a child goes missing on the way to school, and by the time you get to that point, it could be very traumatic for the child and the family. And those are my comments. Thank you. Councillor Rhino. Yeah, following up on a lot here. Uh, you know, I understand where Councillor Tingley is coming, coming from, but, you know, basically it's not a municipal issue. But what's frustrating is we don't have, no longer have a school board to go to. We have, we have some kind of bo uh, entity that makes up and, and they call themselves a CCRSB or whatever. And it's lost its community connection that you could go to and have a discussion over busing. But, you know, I do believe that it, it's operational and I do believe that 
you know, they are have a hard time recruiting bus operators right now because I know uh, just over on Facebook, every once in a while you see this bus isn't running today because they cannot get operators. I, apparently that's a thing. But I guess, uh, you know, it, it's frustrating we don't have a school board, I guess, and, and I'm going to want to pick up on what the warden said. If she talked to the MLA and the MLA said, can't do nothing, that's an operational issue, Who's really running the government? Thank you. Councillor Eisner. Thank you, Madam Chair. It just brought to my attention, just to tag along with, with the rest of the councillors here, that the uh, daycare center that's uh, right beside Curly Portables, they have the issues with they have to go to the schools to get their kids, and they got to walk them down the sidewalk, which is um, they have challenges with some of the kids. They can bolt out into the road. Um, they, they feel that they should have some kind of a busing system to bring those kids t t safe to, the, to their daycare. That's, the, that's what my comment on that. Thank you. Deputy Ward. To echo the comments of my fellow counselors, uh, yeah, this is something that's been going on. Last, last year, uh, Councillor Musa and I were here with the exact same issue, uh, courtesy busing being gone, no sidewalks, no crosswalks on a main number one highway. Um, and the same thing, outcome, just there's not enough buses. They don't have the resources. Uh, I know uh, at the school in Uniac, they requested to have a bus turn, a bus turn installed seven years ago. Uh, two years ago, they cut out the grass and put the gravel down because right now when the kids are being dropped off, there's only room for buses. The parents can't drive up to the front and drop their kids off at the school, but now they're expected to drop the kids off at the school because there's no buses. But there's nowhere for them to do it because they haven't done the work to improve the properties to allow even parents to drop them off. So I would be fully supportive of uh, having a conversation with the minister if, if they would like to attend to let them know the feelings uh, throughout the whole municipality, because this affects everybody. Last year as well, I do believe, and the warden correct me, there was issues in her where they stopped a, uh, a bus stop, which made children, when they did get off the bus, have to walk quite a distance across a busy, busy intersection. And at the end of the day, we should be looking at ways to protect our children and making things easier, not harder. Uh, we can't solve the busing issue here as municipal council, but we should be able to have dialogue about how we get the solutions to make things easier for both the parents and the children. Thank you. Councillor Tingley. Uh, well, I, I hope we can have a meeting with, uh, with CCRCE and the minister, uh, but I just want to respond to a couple of points there. Um, to uh, Councillor Garden Cole's point regarding the policy, uh, that it may very well be policy. I, I don't know. I haven't seen the policy, uh, so I assume that it is. But they have created a pre precedent by uh, b bringing these kids to school as well, and uh, you know they're coming back at the eleventh hour uh, and saying they're going to make this change, and it's creating a, a problem for the uh, for the parents and, and the children. And I agree with uh, Councillor Rhino to a degree. It's not a municipal issue as far as <laughs> busing is concerned. Uh, but the parents are going to be calling us as councillors and uh, asking if we can help them. And whether we can or not, uh, I don't know that at this point type of thing. But uh, I, I just think it's kind of odd that uh, this would have been just a, a, a memo sent out to parents at the end of the year saying this is the situation. Uh, for September, uh, there's no time to, to do anything, and all it does is create panic. If, if, if anything, it was poor communication, and I, I think there should be a meeting. So hopefully we can make a mo I'd like to make a motion that uh, we arrange a, a meeting with uh, CCRCE uh, and the minister to discuss what's happened here and the feedback that we're getting from parents. Okay, you heard the motion. Do we have a seconder? Second. Seconded by the Deputy Warden. I have Councillor McPhee, you are on prior to the motion, so I'll allow you some leeway. Okay, thank you, Warden. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say that, uh, yes, it could be the busing crisis that's causing this, but 
In District 4, I have four, five, six-year-olds walking the Mill Village Road to get to Shibanakdi Elementary, very narrow shoulders. <coughs> Unfortunately, an area prone to speeding, blind crest there, school bus that has rooms to take them, and a bus driver that said they wouldn't mind stopping at the edge of the drive, at the end of the driveway, and yet the authority said, no, you can't do that. So it's great. It's not all that there's not bus drivers and there's not buses. It's more than that. That's all I wanted to point out. I agree that it's ridiculous to have, expect those children to walk through roundabouts and stuff that if they don't, someone has to make some provision for it. But it's an ongoing issue and it's not, you know, I'm not sure that it's just the lack of busing that's bringing this on. Anyway, thank you. Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Madam Warren. I, uh, I agree with my fellow councillor. And there's one more thing. Since we administer the money for education, I think it should be a communication piece with the, with the resident that we take the money, we don't, any, we don't have any power over, school, over the school system or anything, because everything that's happened at school, it comes to us. And if, they, if the resident don't get the response they want, they start trashing us and... Uh, I think that sh there should be a communication piece that we only administer this money to the province and we have nothing to say about it. I don't know if everybody feels the same, but I, th I think myself and Deputy Warden, we already been in that position and it's not funny. Thank you. Deputy Warden, would you take the chair for a moment, please? Go ahead, Warden. Yeah, as I said before, this is an ongoing issue. And the distances that have been set for busing, I believe it's somewhere close to 1.6 kilometers for elementary age children and 2.5 or something like that for junior high and up. Um, that might be great in areas with sidewalks and crosswalks and all those good things. It's not great in areas that don't have those things. In the rural areas, for example, as some other councillors have said, they're very narrow, almost non-existent shoulders in the roads, and they're not in that great a shape in many cases. And in the wintertime, they're not there. They're covered with snow banks. So you've got children having to walk out in the traveled portion of the highway to go to school. You have busing stopped on roads where there's been busing for many years because the kids at the end of the road are in junior high now and they just realize that so we're not going to send the bus up that road anymore. Never mind the four-year-old that lives halfway up that road that now they said oh well you know he's pre-primary we're going to give him a bus stop. So they did in the middle of the intersection of Beaver Bank Road and Highway 14. So it's just not reasonable and it seems to me that there is a disconnect between the folks making the policies and the folks living their lives and having to send their children to school. And I understand, you know, a shortage of bus drivers and that. You know, I'm sorry, but that is CCRCE's job to manage that. It's their job, you know, any business or level. It's our job to keep our positions filled and provide the services that the residents of this municipality require. It's CCRCE's responsibility to do the same thing for the students that attend our schools. Um, I have lots of ideas of things that I think would help. And uh, our, I know our MLA is frustrated, but he is told by the senior employees that if it's operational, he has no input. So I think, uh, I don't know if we'll get the minister here or not, but I certainly think we should try. I think this is unacceptable. And um, this is just my personal opinion, but we are required to turn a substantial amount of money over to CCRCE every year to fund education and educational services for our children. And we have no say in how it's used or anything. And people don't know who to call. Now that there's no school board, they don't know who to call. They call us. They call the MLA. You can't get a number to call anybody who actually has some say about anything. And they're really not interested in talking to people anyway. That's my opinion. And I think 
that perhaps it's time to think outside of the box and if we feel that CCRCE is not providing the service they're responsible to provide in a safe and reasonable manner, I think it's time that this municipality start to have a conversation about withholding some of that funding until we receive satisfaction that they're doing a better job than they appear to be doing now. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Warden. Back to you. And we do have a motion on the floor, which is to try and set up a meeting with CCRCE and the Minister of Education. And I would assume we would invite the MLAs who represent various parts of East Hants as well. Is there any further discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. And I note, as I note, 10 votes. I did neglect to say that Councillor Green is not with us this evening, but he is representing council at the uh, high school graduation at Hans North Rural High this evening. Okay, next, uh, any other uh, correspondence for information there that any councillor wishes to bring particular attention to? I would myself say item 68, um, the Nova Scotia Provincial Housing Agency. No, that's not the one. It's number 69. The uh, from Municipal Affairs and Housing, looking for availability and affordability of housing and requesting help by sharing a list of any municipally owned, serviced, or easily serviceable land that may be suitable for any type of new housing development. Um, I'm not sure what they're hoping to accomplish by this. It, uh, it makes me wonder if their thoughts stray to what they did in HRM. Um, so I just wanted to draw that to council's attention. I don't know if we have any such land or if we have any interest in, in bringing that to their attention. CAO? <clears throat> uh, through you, Madam Warden. So I think, um, we have a good handle on sort of the, the land that we own that might fit into this. I'm not sure that we have any that um, council would be willing to put on a list for um, this purpose. We have very little of, of this land in a serviced or easily serviced area. Um, we do have a surplus property project on the books um, that we have some, some groundwork being done with now with mapping, um, but to pull together a list, we could do that. Um, but it would take a significant amount of time sort of to go through and and I think you would have to go through the process with each property with a assessment of what that property could be for you before you put it on the list um, for this intended purpose. Some municipalities would have lots of parcels of land um, that they've gotten from other, you know, from old schools and whatnot that they know that they're not going to use or don't have a purpose for. East Hans just isn't in that position, <clears throat> excuse me, at this point in time. So I'm wondering, should we respond to this letter and just simply say that we do not have a suitable inventory of land at this time? Okay. Councillor Rhino. I find it a little odd that, you know, they're only looking for land in the serviceable area or supplying services you know well <laughs> I can understand their their thinking for a bit but there is people that live outside the serviceable area that would require housing just as well so I, I so I just find it a bit odd they're they're just the circulating in around one area thank you Um, through Madam uh, Warden, Councilor, I think the um, the conversations that I've been involved with at the NSFM and um, different conferences and meetings is that they're trying to find serviced land so they can build 
a lot of housing very quickly without having to build the infrastructure to service a, a larger development. So it's not that at some point they may not be looking at um, moving outside of the serviced areas, but what the province is looking for now is um, the ability to build a lot of units, and that would entail having services um, just by a matter of the densification is it requires your water and sewer services. Councillor Tingley. Uh, I would move that we uh, respond to this and advise we do not have any serviceable land to, uh, to assist with this initiative at this time. We have a seconder. Seconded by Councillor McPhee. Well, I had somebody there, but they're gone. Any discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. Anything else from correspondence for information? Seeing nothing, uh, we will move on to correspondence for decision. And you have it in front of you. First, we have um, staff are seeking approval for use of a sea container for storage at the Enfield water treatment plant. So who's taking that one? Okay, CAO. So, councillors, there's um, this was brought to our attention through the uh, current project that's being done at the Enfield Water Treatment Plant. That once we um, put the tank in the new treatment plant, we require more storage. Uh, one of the ways to do that would be to bring in a sea container um, on site to provide that storage. Um, the issue we've run into is that all of our public property in the serviced area has been zoned institutional use. And that particular zoning doesn't um, allow sea containers for storage um, on site. All of the other similar types of zoning do uh, allow for sea containers. So you'll see them in your commercial areas and whatnot that are permitted. Um, so there is also a section in our land use bylaw that allows the municipality um, it just says that we're not required to comply with the requirements of the bylaw to license, um, have permission, permit, or authority of anything in the bylaw, which um, is similar to provincial regulations and, and legislation. So um, we are able to, the sea container would be a cost effective method of providing storage. The site itself is set off from. Um, sort of down a hill, so it wouldn't be right in anybody's backyard for sight, sight lines. Um, and from the, um, the only other visible way is from the, the highway on that site. So we don't see any issue. Uh, John doesn't have any issue with it from a planning perspective uh, for the utility of that zone um, in this particular instance. Uh, but I certainly wasn't comfortable just saying go ahead um, because I think that's a decision that council needs to um, use its authority for if it so chooses under the land use bylaw section 1.6. So there is a recommended motion. Uh, if you are okay with us moving ahead with this, um, we do have, the project is ongoing, so we need to act fairly quickly. The alternative is that we would have to put together plans to build storage on site, uh, which would be a shed of some kind, which is gonna put you into um, much more than ten or fifteen thousand dollars for an appropriate size shed. Councillor Rhino, uh, something. You know, maybe I'm I'm just not getting things, remembering things quite well. But wasn't there the development here along Enfield somewhere where they wanted to uh, use uh, containers and it didn't fit and and we didn't allow that I, I, am I correct in saying that thinking that because if if that's the case then how can we go put a container up where we're not supposed to you know John do you have a 
through you, uh, Madam Warden. Uh, it does come up uh, occasionally, uh, for example, with fire halls. Um, um, yeah, so there have been occasions where people have asked and we've told them, no, it's not permitted in the zone. All right, so there, we're setting right there, to me, sets a double standard by saying, oh no, you can't have it, but we can have it. But I, I can't support that. Deputy Ward. I think Jesse's on, he wants to make a comment. I'll let him go before myself. Okay, Jesse, you want to be through Madam Orton, the the example of of fire halls comes in, in, in two flips on, on that is uh, exceptions have been made so so that an exception had to come in and be requested for the training apparatus at the Enfield Fire Hall, and which was Elmsdale. allowed because Elmsdale. Elmsdale sorry Elmsdale Fire Hall um, to allow for training for the the greater good of the municipality and 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 its constituents. So there is an exception with that. And something discussed at the staff level is we're, we're looking for the one-off exception, but it's, a, it's an interesting rule um, that I think needs to be explored at the next time we update the land use bylaw and, and discussed. And we've internally discussed that as staff. The right thing to do is to go back and review that. So areas that cannot use the... the sea containers that have IU zoning. The Lance Lagoon, absolutely, that is a pure industrial site with, you can't see anything from there. I could not use a sea container on that site. There's a literal Quonset Hut storage area on Highway 277. Can't do that either, same zoning. Um, and it, it goes on and on, but that those sites are industrial sites clearly for you need stockpile, you need apparatuses. The uh, sea container looks better than, a, than the Quonset hut we have actually uh, on the 277. And if you've driven by, it's, it's in pretty rough shape. And the sea container on this location is proposed to be temporary in nature and repurposed for other municipal uses in the future. So right now we have inventory within the water treatment plant that needs to be relocated. We're bringing in our, our third DAF plant into into the plant so our third third phase of treatment if you will uh, and we need to move materials out and need to keep them secure because we don't have fenced in yards uh, outside of Milford and Milford doesn't have the capacity to be flexible at this point we had just done an assessment of that site to try and leverage it for storage um, so we're looking for short-term wins while we reassess or short-term options which I would consider a win uh, to help alleviate that operational stress. Um, and, and that's the real in-depth why. So um, when, I, when I, we have multiple repurposing, um, an interesting fact is we do use sea containers at the Waste Management Center because we don't have zoning out in Georgefield. So we use them all over the place. So um, it's just interesting, right? So we've got three in operation now that we've modified, has great operational purpose. It's reusing uh, materials that otherwise would be going to waste. It's, it's all the right things. So I just wanted to, to provide that perspective and, and the right, we have a policy, we, we have a bylaw with a stipulation in it that doesn't feel right. We're not looking for, um, our staff aren't recommending uh, authority to make those decisions ongoing, just this one case, well, to buy us time to look at the bylaw itself, because that's the right thing to do, not to give staff more authority long-term. If another thing comes up, we have to come back. And if it doesn't feel right, <coughs> council can absolutely say no in the future. Um, this one would be an enabling for the water treatment plant project and the construction. It would be, um, it would be very helpful in delivery of a safe project. John. Okay. Thank you, Madam Warden. Yeah, I, I'll just pick up on those comments. Um, I, yeah, per our discussions earlier this week or and last week, I guess, um, I think it does make sense at some point to maybe explore a different zone for these facilities because they are different than this building or the, the aquatic center and that kind of thing. Um, 
they really are more industrial sites. So maybe we talked about calling it an infrastructure zone that would have more, you know, be more like an industrial zone and allow things like storage containers. So, or at least modify the um, the institutional zone when you have facilities like that. So that's something we can look at in the future. And I uh, just reminded me about the. Um, the Elmsdale Fire Hall, that, that was a little bit different. We didn't, um, sea containers aren't permitted for storage there, but they, in that case, it was a building they built out of sea containers for the training facility, so that's how that was permitted. So it, it wasn't um, an exception. It was actually permitted because of the way they built it. So this would be an, an exception that we're looking at here. But, but I agree, I, I don't have it from a planning point of view and land use point of view, I don't think anyone would have any issue with this. Thank you. Councillor Eisner. Thank you, Madam Warden. Through you to staff, what, what's going to, containers going to be used for? And you say storage. I know you'd use a lot of chemicals down there. Uh, through Ma Madam Warden, we would not be storing chemicals. That requires a significant more amount of work and control. This is uh, additional piping, um, water meters, things that aren't, um, aren't, aren't need to be, don't have to have strict environmental controls that we don't have to add on to anything for safety uh, like extra venting or anything like that so it's just basic storage uh, of those types of materials that the utility uses for water breaks things like that i would just suggest to put into get it done up you got to have storage everybody's got to have it thank you councillor mitchell Thank you, Madam Warden. Just to follow up on the discussion, yes, we at, we at the Elmsdale Fire Department have, uh, I guess, sea containers, as you call them. Uh, the premise back then was to build the training facility, and I'm assuming that the training facility that's going to be built in Hans North, using our model, will be similar, using the containers. They're very secure and very sturdy, and they can be secured in a proper manner. So based on that, that the directors have their own temporary and can be used where needed across the municipality, I'll move the recommended motion as presented. I moved by Councillor Mitchell, seconded by Councillor Tingley. Councillor Rhino. Just a question to you, staff. You know, could, could not there be seen uh, a need for storage prior to all this? And why Why is it at this hour? Through Madam Warren, excellent point. There was a an, another project that was in the plan to uh, assess and increase storage in Milford. Uh, we did a structural assessment of the existing building and were not able to proceed. We found a lot of uh, problems and had to step back and reassess. So that was the plan for storage was to relocate a significant amount of items into the front storage building in Milford that is currently full but needing more space. Um, but there was a lot of technical era, um, things that came up and are, are pushing us to... Um, at a high level, seek out new locations for lay down yards and fenced in locations in the future. We just haven't got there. So the original plan was set. We we had the assess pre assessment started, uh, and then t um, that option stopped. And we thought it would happen at the same time. So that was the goal for it to all happen at the same time. And then that second leg project that was in the books and was in the budget uh, fell through, and we didn't weren't able to proceed. So that was the the rationale as to why. So it was foreseen that we needed something, um, but that came, the option came up short and we've been seeking alternatives since. Any further counsel? Tom? Any further discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. And the motion is passed by a vote of nine to one with Councillor Rhino voting nay. Okay, returning to our agenda. 
The next item is the draft response to the NSFM policing survey for council's review and consideration. CAO. Councillors, this um, is, a is a survey that was sent to us by the NSFM. All of the um, responses will be confidential and not um, specifically call out any municipalities as they put this together. I don't know, uh, there's nothing in here that makes this a non-confidential report. So uh, for your consideration, we've gone through and answered the questions. Um, we did have uh, Shirley pulled together the um, the police chief um, or the commander, um, and we'll have your input and the warden's input tonight. Um, really, there's a lot of questions in here. We can go through them if you like, uh, but it's nothing that wouldn't be um, would be new to you folks. As uh, you're all involved in police advisory committee, it talks about police advisory committee in here. I guess the um, the biggest thing that I hear from you and that the RCMP hear is the issue with HR and not having all the positions filled. That's been um, laid out in here and as far as our response. So this is kind of the new way of doing things at the NSFM. So instead of going out to all their members, they're now looking for one response from council. So this is the first time we're seeing uh, probably the third time we're seeing this come through uh, in this type of format. Um, so I guess we would look for your input if you have any. Uh, time is of the essence. I think they um, today or yesterday sent out a notice saying they've extended the deadline to July 7th, uh, which still doesn't give us any, any more time than tonight to sort of look at this and formulate an opinion. So if you wanted to approve the submission as is, or if you wanted to leave it open and have people provide input to me directly over the next few days, we can do that as well. As long as I have authority to submit this before July 7th, we should be in a good place. Councillor Tingley. Uh, through the chair, I just have uh, one question about the cost uh, with these uh, retroactive costs. Um, do we have a copy of the, con oh, you're shaking your head, no. <laughs> I, I'm just wondering if we have a copy of the contract, what does it say about municipalities' responsibility to pay retroactive costs? Like there there's seems to be a whole dispute about this retroactive cost, but what does the contract state? Uh, through you, Madam Warden, the contract states that we shall, uh, municipalities shall or the provincial government shall bear the cost. Um, the province has appealed the, um, the bill, or I'm not exactly sure if that's the right word for it, but, um, but the contract is clear that we will pay for the cost. Uh, what isn't clear in the contract is how consultation should have happened, and that seems to be the point with that municipalities are making that, yes, we understand we have to pay for the cost of RCMP, but nobody consulted us and nobody kept us in, informed and you know all of the things that go along with good contract management uh, weren't done so uh, the municipalities are in a contract to pay for policing services but don't have a copy of the contract the contract through you Madam Warren the contract is between the province Department of Justice and the RCMP we then contract with the province does their contract with us talk about retroactive pay? Um, be, because it's in the contract with the federal government, we're bound by that contract through our contract with them. That's all the questions I have, but this sounds like a pretty uh, loosey-goosey way of uh, communicating. Absolutely. <laughs> Councillor Rhino. Well, my concern is by answering this in this way, this bypasses the police advisory board, uh, bypasses the public members. Um, that's my thoughts on it. Through you, Madam Warden, when this came through, we did express concern to the NSFM that there, I think at that time, was a two or three week turnaround, didn't allow us to do all of that consultation. Um, they understood that. Um, here we are. 
So, Council, what is your wish? Um, are we satisfied to provide this response as staff have uh, have researched and answered the question based on our policies and Deputy Warden? I'll move that we submit this to the NSFM uh, before up to before the the deadline of the was it the seventh of, Ju of July, seventh mm -hmm. of July providing time for any council or any member of, of the police advisory committee, police advisory board to submit uh, any additional comments. Also part of that motion, um, clearly spell out to the NSFM that the timeline for this in writing was not sufficient for proper and adequate uh, vetting through all the channels. I so move. Seconded by Councillor Mitchell. Is there any discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. <coughs> and the motion is passed by a vote of 9 to 1 with Councillor Rhino voting nay. A okay, next item for correspondence for decision is a request from the Ecology Action Center seeking interest in signing on to a joint statement from Nova Scotia municipalities and the Ecology Action Center calling on the province and Minister Hallman to release regulations for the Coastal Protection Act. Uh, Deputy Warden. At this time, I cannot support signing on to this for the simple reason, even though uh, the Ecology Action Center says there was lots of consultation on the Coastal Protection Act, we have not taken part of in this municipality any of that consultation. We were waiting for that consultation. At the last going off, the province initially announced they were delaying bringing this act forward to allow for more time of consultation specifically with municipalities. And until such time that our municipality is consulted on the Coastal Protection Act, I cannot support uh, and this moving forward. Thank you. Does any other councillor have any comments? Would you care to make a motion? I will. Okay. I'll move that we respond that at this time we will not sign on to this statement until such time the municipality uh, receives consultation on the Coastal Protection Act and our input is provided. I so move. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Question. Question's been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. Next item is an email from Kathy Blois, the president of the Hans Senior Safety Association program, advising that after a lot of thought, the board of directors has decided not to put more volunteer hours into preparing and attending another meeting with realistically no sense of hope to change the funding decision made. As a result, their scheduled presentation for the June executive committee has been canceled and a and there will be a decision required regarding the $10,000 community partnership grant funding. I don't know if any member of staff has any comments. CAO? Uh, through you, Madam Warden. Uh, this was um, this email came as a bit of a surprise. We anticipated that the Hans County Senior Safety Association would be joining you in June um, to receive funding. They have been funded by the municipality, and there was a question this year as to um, how that funding should be spent. Um, so 
that was why they were requested to come in and um, and that is just the way we do our budgets. So it's not unusual for us to ask a community group to come in and present to council uh, to get to become to get a community partnership grant, especially, um, <clears throat> especially seen as though coming through the pandemic, um, there was, uh, you know, some of the services for the Hans Senior Safety um, weren't being provided during the pandemic and sort of ramping back up again afterwards. So it's unfortunate that uh, they did not come in to present. What this does, however, with them pulling out of East Hance, it does leave us with a gap in our programming. So I think council needs to um, take a look at that and see what kind of um, programming we may be able to put together for seniors. I think the you know there's definitely room in your in your programming portfolio for a senior engagement position of some kind. Um, there's a lot of folks that that really benefit from the work that is done with senior safety. Uh, but I think there's also, we've seen some really good uptick in um, senior programming around the municipality that, um, that you could really um, work on and, and improve. So I think going along with what's in your strategic plan to make sure that we have um, members of our community who feel included and on your safety piece to make sure that members of your community feel safe um, and have the supports they need from around the community. I think it wouldn't be out of line to um, request a report, uh, probably from Alana's department, to see what might be able to be accomplished within the budgets you have or moving forward with additional funding um, to provide that support to seniors in, in the community. And you know we've, we've had some luck with a seniors um, social here in Elmsdale, but I think that same model for different programs around um, Mount Uniac and in the rural areas as well would truly benefit some of your community members. So uh, we could certainly prepare a report for council on some of the options and um, see where we go into the fall. Thank you. Deputy Ward. Thank you, Ward. Um, to say I'm disappointed in this email or this response would be an understatement. Uh, I really do take exception that they make the claim there was no realistic sense or hope of change of funding and decisions made. Our community partners come in all the time, do presentations, and as council, we make decisions based on the presentations and the evidence they provide us. We, the ask at the end of last year was, for the money that we are providing this organization, how many residents of East Hans did you service? That was the question that they did not answer, and they were gonna come in if you look at the community rider, the community rider was a community partner. They came in, did a presentation, uh, a very good presentation, and they received extra funding. It's, it, there is no expectation that you will not receive funding if you come in and do a presentation. I believe that's the only real way you can get an increase of funding is coming in and doing a presentation to make it clear and transparent to, to the residents what is being funded. So I take, I take exception to that comment, but I will move that staff prepare a report and come back to council with options to increase and provide senior services throughout the municipality and funding and positions that will be required. Seconded by Councillor Tingley. Any discussion on the motion? Questions. Questions from call? Oh, Councillor Mitchell's on. Oh, Councillor Mitchell? Uh, I agree with the uh, motion. My question is, could we send them a thank you for their service over the years and? Perhaps after we deal with this motion, you would like to make okay, a motion thank to you. do that? I think that would be appropriate. Mm. Well, the question's been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion is passed unanimously. Councillor Mitchell. Yes, thank you, Madam Warden. I make a motion to send them a thank you to the President and to the Board of Directors for their service over the years. I had done with grace you appreciated that they were looking out for senior safety. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Hebb. Any discussion on the motion? Question. Questions been called? And the motion is passed unanimously. 
Okay, moving along, we have a request from the Rotary Club of Sackville seeking a $500 general government grant funding for the Recycle Your Cycle program that pro provides bicycles and helmets to kids who need them, including children from the Mount Uniac area. Deputy Warden. A um, little background, it says here in the letter, they, uh, they've passed over 100 bikes so far this year, and 33 of those bikes were presented to East Hans res residents uh, in Mount Uniac. Um, I think it's a good program. It's $500. It helps uh, afford the helmets that go along with these bikes because you can't really use a used helmet they're, as they're a safety item and have to be certified, and the cost of helmets keeps going up. So um, that $500 won't even cover the amount of helmets that were passed out in East Hans. Uh, so for that, I'll move that we provide $500 of funding to the Rotary Club of Sackville. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Hebb. We're on before the motion, Councillor Rhino. I will allow you a little leeway. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Warden. Is there any way to guarantee that that $500 will be spent in these tents if this, if this is granted? I, I would just, to, to answer your question, Councilor Rano, I would say they've already spent way more than 500 already in these stands. I don't doubt your word, but is there any way that we can have this proof? Because I wouldn't want to see uh, taxpayers' money going to outside of the municipality for a project like this. If we're going to give grant of money from taxpayers' money, I would like a guarantee that that money will be spent within these stands. I think what we could ask for would be a report from the group outlining how many bikes and helmets, similar to what other groups have to report after they receive their financing. We could certainly ask for that report. That, but that report may not, it will not guarantee that that money being spent in these hands. And this is, this is what I'm hung up on. It would provide us the information to make decisions on any future grant requests. So. Well, well, really? We have the experience in the past that it has been spent without a grant, so. Well, if, to me, if there's no guarantee, I can't support the motion. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? Questions been called. And the, motion, and the motion has passed by a vote of 9 to 1. Councillor Rhino voting nay. Next item on decision for our correspondence for decision, and we seem to have a lot of it uh, <laughs> this month compared to other months. We have a letter from Kristen Pike of Patterson Law on behalf of her clients Lorraine and Herb Bury, owners of three properties located at 208 Feather Lane in Enfield. The owners are seeking to confirm the deeded access to their property and have proposed an easement agreement. The municipality owns a parcel of land that the access crosses and would be a party to the agreement. The suggested motion is that council authorize the CAO to enter into an agreement to permit an easement across lot eight at 14 Feather Lane, identified as PID 4515381 for 208 Feather Lane based on legal review and any subsequent changes that keep the intent of the same. So CAO, let's translate that for us. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Warden. Uh, so we have this request. Um, the property in question that the municipality owns is the property that our engineered spring sits on. Uh, this easement would be through that property as is the easement through all of the they're very long, skinny properties that come up from, from the edge of the lake. Um, there's really no reason why council wouldn't provide this easement. Uh, the, the first version that came in with this, um, there was a few questions around subdivision. They've since changed that um, and resubmitted this particular easement, um, which doesn't cause us any concern. And the reason the wording is based on legal review and subsequent changes that keep the intent the same is that there are several parties to this agreement. So um, if in consultation with all of the different lawyers that are involved in with all those property owners, 
They may require some tweaking to wording here and there in the agreement before it gets settled. Um, so we would look at that and have sort of looked to make sure that the intent doesn't change uh, from the easement that's been requested. The agreement was posted to council chambers online as confidential because it has several other property owners listed with their PIDs and their personal information. Uh, but councillors have that. It's just not posted here under correspondence for decision. Uh, but the general intent of what's being um, requested is here. Uh, the Burries are the husband and wife who lived on um, Feather Lane. They were the couple that uh, funded the park in Enfield uh, by the fire hall um, and I believe are very active in the CCOA project and have supported that as well. So um, they have since moved back to the um, Switzerland, I believe. Um, and they're trying to clean up their property so they can sell it on Grand Lake. And council, what is your wish? Someone prepared to move the recommended motion or something different? Councilor Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Warden. Since, since uh, staff has said there's no issues with it, I'll move the recommended motion as presented. Moved, seconded by Councillor Musa. <coughs> Excuse me. Any discussion on the motion? Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, um, Madam Warden. So, just to uh, confirm this, this is sent to us on behalf of the Burries who are listed and a number of those other residents? Uh, through you, Madam Warden, it's sent to us on behalf of the Burries. There is a number of people <coughs> whose land they have to cross over to get to their property who they're trying to clean up all of the easements. Oh, sorry. Um, through you, Madam Warden, this was sent to us um, on behalf of the Burries. Right. There are a number of properties that this easement has to cross in order for them to have full access to their property through an easement. Right. Those people are all party to the same easement agreement. Okay. So they've structured it so they're all part of that agreement. So so this so those people are sorry, but this it, is I'm I'm just gonna say it. This is above my pay grade here. So yeah. what how this was described. So you're saying that the those people listed are that this is fine with them. We haven't consulted with them. The way that the easement will work is everybody will have to sign on for it to happen because the, the property in question is on a point. So that you have to cross over all of the other properties to get to the point. If one of those parties doesn't sign, then they don't have a clear easement to their property. So I'm not sure what would happen at that point. Okay. But from a municipal, this... municipal perspective, we have no reason why we wouldn't let them cross over with an easement over the municipal property. Okay, okay, yeah. good. Thank you. I just wanted to be clear on that. Thank you. Councilor Rhino. I guess I don't have a concern with the subject. I guess I have a concern with around procedure. It seems to me we often are making motions that are not being read into record. They're saying as, as the recommended motion. I guess uh, I would prefer that they be read into the record and not just say as presented. It's one thing to do that at executive. I, I feel it's another issue to do it uh, at uh, council. And uh, they sh in my opinion, they should be read into the record, not just say as presented. I did read the motion when I presented the case. But the council. mover did not read, read, read the motion. That's my point, this procedure. Any further discussion? Question has been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. The next item is a letter from the Joint Regional Transportation Agency inviting a member of staff to participate on the Municipal Working Group, CAO. Thank you, Madam Warden. Um, I think you're all familiar with the Joint Regional Transportation Agency. Uh, John Woodford and I have been participating in their um, discussions to this point. I would recommend that, that council appoint John to be the primary 
participant on the municipal working group with myself as a second. Someone prepared to move that motion? Deputy Warden? Uh, thank you, Warden. Uh, I'm prepared to move that motion. Uh, one of the things, though, I'd like to see that if discussion comes up in this group that affects a certain area or a certain community, that the district councilors be talked about before anything is, is committed to because there are definitely some things I know in my, in my district um, that the people do not want, but there's other people who seem to want it. And I want to make sure that the voice of the people who live there is, is heard as well. But I will move that Director Woodford be the member appointed to the Joint Regional Transportation Authority with the CAO uh, as the backup. Seconded by Councillor Mitchell. Any discussion on the motion? Question. Questions been called. Someone has not voted. And the motion is passed unanimously. Next item, Council is asked to approve the attached resolution regarding banking to facilitate the change of signing authorities with the Royal Bank for the new Director of Finance, CAO. Uh, Councillors, this is um, something we do every time we change our banking authority. Uh, this particular resolution needs to be passed word for word. Um, basically, it describes our um, two signatures being required. Uh, your policy says that it's either the director of finance or the manager of finance to sign or with um, the CAO or the assistant municipal, assistant municipal clerk to sign. Uh, so that gives you the, your controls within, between the finance department and the CAO's office that, um, that protect the municipality from, from any fraud. Um, this is a standard resolution required by the bank that we can't change the wording on. So it's either something we want to approve or uh, we can take it back to them to have it uh, modified in some way that council may see fit. What is your wish, council? Deputy Warden. I'll move that we approve the resolution to amend the design jointly authority with the names listed for the bank or the Royal Bank of Canada. Seconded by Councillor Kingley. Any discussion on the motion? Question has been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. Next item on correspondence for decision. Uh, a letter from Public Works regarding a three-year cost share agreement for J-Class Subdivision Streets. The current agreement for the paving of Subdivision Streets expires March 31st, 2024. Attached is the new three-year agreement to be entered into with the Minister of Public Works in order to continue the program. The required resolution of council is also attached for council approval. CAO. Through Madam Warden, uh, the resolution of council that, that is required is on the screen. Um, <clears throat> it would be moved that the warden and um, the CAO be authorized to sign cost share agreement number 2023-010. Um, that would give us authority to enter into cost sharing agreements um, as council motions allow for the next three years. Similar document was done in 2020, I believe. Um, this just gives the province acknowledgement that we plan to or are able to participate in the cost sharing program for the next three years. Deputy Warden. Uh, through you, Warden, uh, to CAO or the Director of Infrastructure. Uh, the agreement that was presented for us to enter into, uh, was there any changes from the previous agreement to this agreement? Jesse? Uh, through you, Madam Warden. Uh, so I have to actually commend the province. They did some great updates on their procurement terminology. So um, 
their procurement documents look like they have seen the rigor that our procurement documents have now um, gone through. And this agreement spells all the categories that we are putting in all our agreements, which is new. So the last agreement didn't have a lot of legalese. There was one thing that, that uh, caught our attention was um, approval of budget within 10 days of notification in their clause. And we followed back with their staff to understand what is the true intent and dialogue back and forth and seeking approval. And they, the province came back, no, it's understood that if there, there's adjustments, there will be a time to, to debate and dialogue and get those through procedures. So it was just a standard wording that they were using across the province. So we sought out verification. We fought, found that significant difference in wording in from years past because it was it was blank on the topic before. So they had, so they brought that in. Um, but in the overall, it's modern language in the agreement, but the same principles from years gone by. It would okay. be my 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 high level summary. Okay, thank you. Uh, that that answers my question. So I would move the resolution that the warden and CAO be authorized to sign cost share agreement number two zero two three dash zero one zero. Seconded Moved and seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Question. question has been called. Someone has not voted. Tom, uh, Tom stepped out. So the motion has passed unanimously by those who are in the room. Does that conclude correspondence for decision, folks? Yes. Next, we will, pardon? Yeah, it was a, a lot, yes. Uh, next is the ratification of the Mount Uniac RCMP lease agreement. And who's taking that one? Adam. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Warren. <clears throat> so as council recalls, you gave, previously provided us direction in camera to work on a new lease with the RCMP in Mount Uniac for the Mount Uniac um, satellite office. Uh, the negotiations were uh, successful with the RCMP um, and aligned with all of the conversations that we had. Uh, there was um, one adjustment that we did make along the lines of um, consumer price index or a minimum of 2% or uh, consumer price index, what is greater. Just the way the, the RCMP does their negotiations, it's really hard administratively to have the ups and downs with the CPI. So we actually were able to negotiate a 5% flat um, throughout the term, which we, we felt was a really uh, strong position for the municipality. So we have the recommendation in front of you um, to move forward. The increase for the cost of the lease space are what we discussed in camera uh, and happy to report that we're ready to proceed with ratification. Thank you, Adam. So you have the information in front of you, councillors. Someone prepared to move Deputy Warden. I'll move that council ratify the in-camera direction given to staff at the March 2023 Executive Committee meeting to enter into a lease agreement for the Mount Uniac RCMP Satellite Office effective June 1st, 2023 for a term of three years with two options to renew for one year each for a rental rate starting at $8,935.44 per year plus HST with a rental rate to be adjusted cumulatively by 5% for each year of the lease. Seconded by Councillor Gordon Cole. Is there any discussion on the motion? Question. Question has been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. Oh, next item is first reading of bylaw P-1300, the blasting bylaw. And that will be coming from Councillor Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Warden. <clears throat> 
First reading by Law P1300, Blasting by Law. At the January meeting of council, staff were directed to bring back a report on blasting and drop blasting by law for East Hands. The Planning Advisory Committee reviewed the report and draft by law during the Executive Committee meeting held on June 20th, 2023, and recommended, and recommended this reading. The Planning Advisory Committee recommends to council give first reading to bylaw P1300, blasting bylaw. As chair, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Musa. Is there any discussion on the motion? Councillor Rhino. Yes, I, I do believe that this bylaw was created around the fact that it was blasting issues in the Mount Uniac area. I guess my question would be through to the two Mount Uniac representatives. Does this address your concerns in a way that will be proactive and positive going forward? Deputy Warden. Uh, thank, thank you, Warden. Uh, in response, the biggest issue um, in Mount Uniac is the quarries, uh, and the quarries fall under a different fall under Department of Environment for regulations. Where this will help is anywhere where there's new development taking place, um, and they are required to blast for roads or create their own blasting on site. They will fall under the, under this bylaw, and currently. Uh, that will alleviate some of the issues going on, but I think it will help across the whole municipality, uh, anywhere where there's bedrock, which is a lot of a lot of East Hants, uh, the blasting to put roads in, uh, allow the residents around them to have their their uh, ability to get their assessments done in their homes, so they won't be negatively impacted. Thank you. Any further discussion? Question. Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. We'll now move into committee reports and we'll begin with the audit committee. Over to you, Deputy Warden Perry. The committee held a virtual and in-person meeting on June 28th, 2023. The committee received a presentation from Paul Jaynes, CPA CA, and Daniel Goosen, CPA from Deloitte on the 2022-2023 audit results. Recommendations are coming forward to Council in July 2023. As Chair of the Committee, I move the adoption of this report. Seconded by Councillor Musa. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary, motion is carried. Next, uh, we'll stay with uh, Deputy Warden Perry for Corporate and Residential Services Committee Report. The committee held its regular meeting on June 20th, 2023 in council chambers. The following motions are coming forward as a result of that meeting. Councillor benefits. NSFM group benefits are now open to councillors. Cost share for the coverage would be 50% paid by the councillor, 50% by the municipality. The CAO gave councillors four options for coverage, life insurance, accidental death and dismemberment, and dependent life insurance only, health and dental only. All benefits or to not join the plan. The corporate residential services Committee recommends to council, council members be eligible for life insurance, accidental death and dismemberment, dependent life insurance, and health and dental coverage. Chair of the committee, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Mitchell, Councillor Rhino. Well, it's no surprise, isn't As stated in committee, I did not support this, and I still do not support this. I think, you know, I know that when we all went on council, that we, knew, we all knew or should have known that there was no benefit with regard to pension, life insurance, ex, uh, benefit, health benefits, or no such thing. We all accepted that. And, and I, as I understand it, if this passes, it will be one half the employee and one half of the employer will be paying the premiums. So that means the employer, the municipality of East Hans, will or the taxpayer, will be paying half. And we, the recipients, will be paying half. But my, my, my point is, we, the recipients, are paid by the taxpayer as well. So the taxpayer is funding this whole thing. As was brought up here in the executive day, this follows on a 7% increase in our stipend that we get this year. 
Next, and I want to remind everybody, coming Saturday, 17% interest to, to uh, or 17% increase in the in tax in the gas tax. Seven and that same on heating oil. A ripple effect on that will be the cost of food, the cost of uh, supplies coming in because everything is trucked in, so costs are going up. <coughs> this to me is not a not the thing to do. It's no wonder that that. Uh, uh, politicians are viewed the way they are when we bring something like this in halfway through a term when we didn't have it before and we were elected when we didn't have this before. It was brought up here, oh, we have, could be uh, an advantage to attract new, new people to run uh, for council. And as I stated in the executive, if people are running for council to get health care and benefits, I wouldn't vote for them. So it's, I, I'm, I'm just thoroughly upset with this and uh, I will not be supporting this and uh, thank you. Council Kingley. Uh, through the chair, I just have a question. Uh, can councillors opt in or out of this program? Only if you have existing benefits. Any councillor who has pre-existing benefits can opt out. Okay. If you don't have existing benefits, you would be required to participate. Or alternative benefits. Or alternative benefits. Okay. Uh, well, I do have benefits, and I, I initially, in executive, uh, was against this. But after thinking about what everybody said, um, I, I think I'm more for it uh, for the people that do, do not have benefits for all the reasons that have been stated. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to support this motion. Thank you. Any further discussion? Questions. Questions been called. And the motion has passed by a margin of nine to one with Councillor Rhino voting nay. Council remuneration and travel reimbursement policy. The proposed revision. Thank you. The proposed revision to policy is an increase to the meal allowance to bring them in line with the amounts allowable at the Canadian Revenue Agency. The meal allowance is, is strictly for when traveling for council business, conferences, or training, and does not apply to executive committee and council meetings. The amendment changes the meal allowances to $18 for breakfast, $21 for lunch, and $30 for dinner, effective April 1st, 2023. The Corporate Residential Service Committee recommends to council that council approve the amendments for the council remuneration and travel reimbursement policy effective April 1st, 2023, as attached to the Executive Committee agenda dated June 20th, 2023. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Musa. Is there any discussion on the motion? Question. Questions been called. And the motion is passed by a vote of nine to one with Councillor Rhino voting nay. Year end memo. Part of the presentations for the audit, part of the preparations for the audit committee is the analysis of the operating capital funds. Several year end entries are required to prepare the financial statements. These are unpredictable and or the exact amounts are unknown at budget time. On the capital side, funding source amounts do not require any adjustment for any projects. All adjustments being recommended are for either unavoidable or prudent to make and can be considered by council to be unsubstantive in their nature. The, council, the Corporate Residential Service Committee recommends to council that they approve the year-end adjustments to the operating funds included in the 2022-2023 year-end adjustment report presented to Executive Committee on June 20th, 2023. As Chair of the Committee, I remove. Seconded by... Councillor Hebb. Councillor Hebb. Any discussion on the motion? Question. Question has been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. Special Reserve Policy Update. The municipality established reserve funds to finance future expenditures which minimizes tax rate fluctuations. The appendix to the Special Reserve Policy is listed, lists the purposes of each fund and where applicable, how it will be funded. 
based on council's motions and the approved budget changes to the appendix are being recommended the corporate residential services committee recommends the council a council amend the special reserves policy attached to the 20th of june 2023 executive committee agenda As chair of the committee i so move Seconded by Councillor Mitchell. Is there any discussion on the motion? Question. Question has been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. African Nova Scotia land acknowledgement. An Indigenous land acknowledgement is read at the committee and council meetings and all major public events. Council is considering a second acknowledgement regarding African Nova Scotian history. Staff investigated whether other organizations do and the findings were presented to the committee. The Corporate Residential Services Committee recommends the council. The council approve the following wording for the land acknowledgement as required under the council procedure policy. I'd like to begin with by acknowledging that we are Mi'kma'ki and the District of Spaganagadi and the ancestral unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. East Hans further acknowledges the 50 African Nova Scotian communities whose 400 year history have contributed to the province, culture, history, and legacies. We are all treaty people. As chair of the committee, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Mitchell. Councillor Rhino. As stated in the executive, I uh, cannot support this the way it is. I was saying, like I said there, I was brought up to everyone is equal and everyone should be treated fairly. I do understand the Mi'kmaq land acknowledgement but I guess I don't think this other acknowledgement goes far enough to uh, identify other uh, peoples or groups of peoples that have come to Nova Scotia and Canada and who have contributed to this province also. I would like to see this go back and be a more inclusive acknowledgement if you know when we head down this road I think it should we all should be equal and we should be equal if we're going to do do an acknowledgement and I do not feel that this this the way it's written goes far enough and did not acknowledge the other people who have uh, other groups of people who have contributed to this great land of ours any further discussion Questions been called. And the motion has passed by a vote of nine to one with Councillor Rhino voting nay. Alan Shaw Boulevard. Oh. Oops. Were you wish to speak, Councillor Mitchell? Thank you, Madam Warren. I just uh, would like to thank Council for the acknowledgement of African Nova Scotians who have been here for 400 years and have contributed to the growth and history of our province. Thank you. Back to you, Deputy Warden. Allen Shaw Boulevard lands, turn deed back to the province. A portion of the Allen Shaw Boulevard was conveyed to East Hance, but should have remained in provincial ownership. It is recommended that that parcel be conveyed to the province of Nova Scotia. The Corporate Residential Services Committee recommends to Council, the Council Dean Parcel AS1 Bravo surplus, and authorize the CAO to execute, deed, execute a deed conveying parcel of AS1B, Allen Shaw Boulevard to the province. As chair of the committee, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Tingley. Any discussion on the motion? Question. Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. General government grants policy. The general government grant policy outlines four grants intended to support the development of a strong community. The pros updates to the policy are an added reference to groups, programs, or services that align with the municipality's strategic plan to provide greater clarity on which groups are eligible to receive funding and a simplification of section 4.1, which states applications will be on a first come, first served basis. The Corporate and Residential Services Committee recommends the Council. The Council approve the General Government Grant Policy Amendments as attached to the Executive Committee Agenda dated June 20th, 2023. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Hebb. Is there any discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion is passed unanimously. Just, there we go. 
Community Partnership Fund Policy. The Community Partnership Fund Policy outlines how the municipality selects and provides funding to community organizations. These organizations are primarily groups that provide substantial programming beyond what the municipality offers. The pros updates to this policy are clarifications around the strategic plan and timing of deliverables and the cosmetic change to reflect an updated municipal template and standard. The Corporate Residential Services Committee recommends to Council, Council approve the Community Partnership Fund Policy Amendments as attached to the Executive Committee Agenda dated June 20th, 2023. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Mitchell. Is there any discussion on the motion? The question has been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. As chair of the committee, I move the adoption of this report. Second. So moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary, motion is carried. Next, we will go to Councillor Mitchell for the uh, Planning Advisory Committee report. Planning Advisory Committee report. The committee held its regular meeting on June 20th, 2023 in Council Chambers. The following motions are coming forward as a result of that meeting. PLN 23-004, Craig Langell, redesignation, rezoning, first reading. The municipality had received an application from Craig Langell to redesignate and rezone the property at 25 Burgess Road, Shubenacadie, as well as extend the Shubenacadie growth area, growth management area to enable construction of a two unit dwelling. The Planning Advisory Committee recommends to Council that Council give first reading and authorize staff to schedule a public hearing to consider a proposal from Craig Lange to amend the designation and zone of the subject property and to extend the Shubenacity GMA, Growth Management Area. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Second. Seconded by Councillor McPhee. Is there any discussion on the motion? Question has been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion is passed unanimously. Back to you. PLN 23-001, Andrew Kim, Development Agreement, Mixed Use Building, Initial Report. The applic application is for a commercial building at 251 Highway 214 Elmsdale. The application includes a drive through which requires a development agreement. Discussions were held around the placement of the drive through over a water transmission main easement and traffic concerns. The Planning Advisory Committee recommends to Council that Council give initial consideration to enter into development agreement for a mixed-use commercial building, which includes a drive through located at 251 Highway 214 Elmsdale to enable a public hearing and to authorize staff to, to schedule a public hearing. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Hebb. Is there any discussion on the motion? Questions been called. <coughs> and the motion has passed by a vote of nine to one, with Councillor Rhino voting nay. Back to you. PLN 23-006, ELT Property Holdings Limited, MPS and LUB Mapping Amendment, request for a public information meeting. An application has been received to change the land use designation to allow for the construction of three 24-unit apartment buildings. Decision was held on density and traffic impacts. The Planning Advisory Committee recommends to Council that Council authorize staff to schedule a public information meeting to consider an application from ELT Property Holdings Limited to amend the MPS and LUB by change the land use designation of PID 45118221 and PID 45078748 to medium density residential neighborhood MR and rezone the same lands to multiple, u multiple unit residential R3 zone. As chair of the committee, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Hebb. Is there any discussion on the motion? Question. Question has been called. And the motion.
motion has passed by a vote of eight to two with Councillor Rhino and Councillor Garden Cole voting nay. PLN 21-009, FH Development Group, Inc. Initial reading of mapping amendments and initial consideration of a development agreement. An application be received for a development agreement for a mixed use master planned neighborhood. An open house and public meeting was held, were held May 2nd, 2023. Discussion was held around limiting the number of units built to 100 before requiring a second entrance exit to the development. The Planning Advisory Committee recommends to Council that Council direct staff to discontinue allowing developments to exceed the 100 unit minimum before requiring a second entrance exit when negotiating development agreements prior to coming to council. As chair of the committee, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Musa. Is there any discussion on the motion? Councillor Tingley. Um, question uh, through the chair to staff. Um, d will this pose a problem for development, uh, like 100 units, because you could have one building that's 100 units? Um, thank you, Madam Warden. I, I think it it won't. I mean, there there's certainly more restrictions when we're negotiating now. Um, but uh, for example, the the application that um, generated this concern, a number of their uh, multi units will actually front onto Highway Two anyway, so they won't be counted in that 100. So it is an additional restriction for sure, but um, you know, we'll deal with it. Okay, I'm satisfied with that. Yeah. Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Madam Warden. Uh, through you, to John, like uh, for the for the uh, development already approved, uh, what what this will mean, like. Through you, Madam Warden, again. Um, for development that's already approved, it has no impact. So, for example, in the Clayton um, and the Armco, or yes, Clayton and Armco and the first FH uh, development agreements, um, it's already in those development agreements that uh, I think it's 300 units before they require a second access. So that that's locked in. We we can't change that now. Um, so we'll follow that development agreement in processing. Um, uh, applications for subdivision as those move forward. And for that second access, is, it has to be up to standard or? I, I know, you know where I'm coming from for, for the development in Mount Union. Yeah. And the second exit is no way near a, any standard. So I think after those fires that happened, we should be, I don't know if we, if, I, don't, I should know if we can be liable for that if we, if we don't do anything, don't do anything about it. I think something should be done there, and uh, it's either an access or it's either a logging road. So, uh, to you, Madam Warden. Um, so now we're talking about cottage country and the development that's now more than a decade old. Um, in that DA, there was a requirement for a second access, but it didn't have to meet the municipal road standard, which I think is the issue. Uh, there were there was some wording in the DA that it had to be passable year round. Um, you know, some general language about uh, the type of road it had to be, but I, I have heard that there are some issues with that. Um, but it has been checked by the development officer, and in her opinion, it does meet what was required in the DA. So I don't know what you want talking about, but there is one that is blocked all the time by, there, there is like, it's closed, so something happened. So through through you, Madam Board, it shouldn't be. So if that's the case now, then then I guess I don't we know can if take that's another right look at one. It. I, I don't know. I've seen something over there, but it's like a, it it got that bar that block it. And after what happened in Hamas Plain, yeah. oh my God! And I don't know if we get if something happened and people couldn't get out. If we if we get liable because it's an agreement that a second exit should be. Yeah. I think so, so it should be passable. So that's something we could check. I think, I think we should. It's either passable or stop everything until it's passable. Thank you. Deputy Warden. Thank you. Um, for this year, we talk 100 units and we're talking about, 
you know, this is, as Councilor Moose has stated, like, you know, it's kind of been spurred on by what happened out in Hammond's Plains. Um, I I don't think it's the number we should look at. I think I think there should have been more consultation done, that there should have been talk talk with fire services and stuff about about the differences between a built-up area with full services and fire hydrants and the ability to have rapid access to water versus a rural area that doesn't have that um, and the proximity. So I can't support this 100 units because I don't think we have enough information uh, coming from our fire services about what would be the, you know, what, 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 what was the appropriate measure, measure, measure to fight a fire in a built-up area versus a unserviced area um, where there is a larger amount of trees in a built-up area, you're, you know, you you don't have as many trees as, as as before. And that's all I have. Thank you. Councilor Hamp. Thank you, Madam Warden. Oops, what? sorry. Oh, oh, there we go. Um, 100 units. That could be two buildings right on a major highway, like number two. And for the developer to put in a second road uh, exit, I mean, that could be in the second or third phase. And it uh, seems to me it would, would, would hamper the developer a awful lot by doing that. If, if these buildings were back in a major lot somewhere, I could understand it. But um, this is going to be placed no matter where the buildings are, 100 units. So uh, uh, I don't think I can support that. Thank you. Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, um, Madam Warden. So 100 units is currently our, has always been our number though, right? It's just been altered through development agreement. Is that right? To, to you, Madam Warden. Um, so the 100, it's 100 lots is the standard in our subdivision bylaw. So you can't create more than 100 lots without a second exit. When we were negotiating these development agreements for large communities with a mixture of, of single, semis, townhouse, and multi-units, um, we recognized that you know 100 lots could actually get you hundreds and hundreds of dwelling units. So we set the number at 300. Um, so it, it was you know it's a bit apples and oranges. It's not the same thing as the 100 in the. Okay, so let's bylaw. say um, the the subdivision by the Elmsdale Mill. Like, I'm thinking 100 lots in there before a second, although I know that didn't work out like that, but 100 lots in there before a second exit. Um, whereas this would be, for example, an apartment building that had 72, an apartment building and a half would end up being. But if they're right on the road, then that's not yeah. considered the same thing, right? If they're the, road frontage. Yeah, th to you, Madam Ward, the way we intended to draft the DA would be that if they if they actually have direct access to Highway Two, we wouldn't count them. It's only those on any new streets that are created into the the new development, we would add up the hundred there, not not anything directly fronting on Highway Two. Okay, okay, thank you. For clarification, fronting on Highway Two means a driveway onto Highway. Correct. Two. Yeah. Thank you. Any further discussion, Councillor Hebb? Thank you, and just just for clarification again, so. If it's within two or three lots of a major highway, um, they would still be considered 100 units. That's correct. As the warden pointed out, if it if it's not um, directly onto the that arterial, we would include it in the 100 that's permitted off of that new street. Okay. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Thank you. Uh, that's exactly the reason why I can't support this because. If you look at a development and there's two buildings that are front on the number two, they don't want to have two driveways, one for each of those buildings come on number two. There's normally parking in the rear. They adjoin it with other, with other forms of housing, whether it be row houses or, or uh, townhouses, and there's kind of a medi space in the parking lot, then that goes onto the feeder road and then comes out. So what's going to happen is you're going to force development to have multiple driveways and access point going directly onto highway two rather than a clean entrance onto a secondary road coming down for a safer uh, onloading and offloading of people coming to access the highway too. It's just going to actually create more and more congestion uh, rather than having a, a better tra traffic flow. So for that, I can't support this bylaw. Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Morton. I can't, I can't support 
this motion. Uh, I think we have a good planning staff, and that's why where the reports come, if they see any danger of having, not having to, to access, I think they will bring it in. Uh, I feel like we're blocking, just, just putting a blanket and we're taking away their job to, to discuss anything that could be good or could be bad. I, I feel we have good staff and I'll leave it with their hand. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Warden, would you take the chair, please? Sure. Go ahead, Warden. <clears throat> yeah. Well, I continue to support this and I, I, you know, I'm the first to say perhaps it's not perfect and perhaps down the road we'll, we'll make some changes. But right now, I'm just not comfortable. I know we say apartment buildings and they might be fairly close to a road, but they might not. And you're still, if there's 100 people there, or 200 units, there's going to be 200 cars trying to get out of there. And if there's a fire that blocks that one exit to the road, and I understand that there may be pipe services and everything available there, but that assumes that whatever emergency or fire has not cut electricity so that the water is available at the hydrants. It assumes that fire trucks are able to get in that one entrance to get to the fire hydrants. So I do think that second entrance is, is important, and I understand that it'll be more important in some cases than it will others, but I don't think it puts a huge burden on these developers because these large developments they know where the road networks are going. They have those planned out at the beginning of their, of their project. And it just simply means that there's going to be an exit in place if the unthinkable should happen again. Because a month, a month and a half ago, it was unthinkable. And it's just not unthinkable to me anymore. So for those reasons, I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. So, Madam, Madam Morton. Um, Go ahead, John. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you, uh, Deputy Warden. Um, so I guess just hearing the discussion around the room, um, you know, one, one another alternative might be actually to send it back to staff for a report where we could actually look into what other jurisdictions do, and I guess kind of the best thinking in the area because it is a bit on the fly in terms of, you know, pulling a number out of the air and um, and turning it into a motion. But um, you know, I'll offer that. Okay, go ahead, Warden. But that would allow this particular development, that would allow a negotiation while we wait for a report to once again go to, you know, maybe 300 units before a second exit. And, you know, maybe I'm the only one here, but to me, I, I still see in my mind's eye those videos of people trying to get out. And safety trumps it all for me, and uh, that's how I'm going to vote my conscience on this one, and that's just how it is. Thank you. Thank you, Warden. So I'll turn the chair back over to you where there's a motion on the floor. Any further discussion on the motion? Questions been called. And the motion has passed by a vote of seven to three with uh, Deputy Warden, Councillor Hebb, and Councillor Eisner voting nay. Back to you, Councillor Mitchell. The Planning Advisory Committee recommends to Council that Council give first reading to an application from FH Development Group, Inc. to amend the MPS and LUB by changing the land use designation and zone uh, P, uh, PID 45089802 to Walkable Comprehensive Development District, WCDD, and give initial consideration entering into a development agreement to prevent a mixed-use master plan development. As chair of the committee, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Tingley. Is there any discussion on the motion? Thanks. Questions been called. <clears throat> and the motion is passed by a vote of nine to one with Councillor Rhino voting nay. 
Bylaw P1300, Blasting Bylaw. A draft Blasting Bylaw was presented to committee for consideration. The bylaw is similar to the HRM bylaw and has been written so that responsibility for checking compliance rests with the applicant blaster qualified monitor due to the lack of resource to administer the bylaw. A motion for first reading was dealt with earlier in the meeting. Is that appropriate? Yes. No motion going forward? Correct. Public information meeting policy. This policy is intended to provide greater clarity for counselors, public members of the Planning Advisory Committee, staff, applicants, and the general public regarding the role of each and expected behavior at meetings. The Planning Advisory Committee recommends to council the council approve the public information meeting policy as attached to executive, executive committee agenda dated June 20, 2023. As chair of the committee, I so move. Seconded by Councillor Musa. Is there any discussion on the motion? Question. Questions being called. And the motion is passed by a vote of nine to one with Councillor Rhino voting nay. As chair of the committee, I move the adoption of this report. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Hebb. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary, motion is carried. Next, we will move to the Infrastructure and Operations Committee report. Councillor Garden Cole. Oh, I just used her. Thanks. <clears throat> Can I get that one bigger, Sharon? Sure. I think that's good. The committee held its regular meeting on June 20th, 2023 in council chambers. There is one motion coming forward as a result of that meeting. First motion or first, first item is Gosbridge Safety Street Light. In December 2021, council approved moving forward with the installation of a safety light near Gosbridge. Inadequate wiring at the intended location led to a technical site review by Nova Scotia Power and quote to install the light. As this light is in an unserviced area as defined by the street lighting policy, the cost will be funded from the general tax rate. Total cost for supply and installation was quoted at $4,378 before tax. The Infrastructure and Operations Committee recommends to Council that Council approve the estimated $4,378 plus tax for the installation of a safety light near Gosbridge and South Maitland to be funded from the Transportation Roads Contracts Reserve. As chair of the committee, I so move. Seconded. Seconded by Councillor Rhino. Is there any discussion? Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Madam Morton. So, so to, to through you to Jesse. Uh, in in any other circumstance, like in any other area, this this light should be uh, paid for by the street lights like the safety lights, right? Through Madam Warden, this, this topic is really meant, the, the concept of safety lights is, is intended as just a very unique circumstance um, that council's used on two other occasions, and this would be the third. Um, Overall, the intent of the streetlight policy is to capture street lighting zones and pavement catchments. And there's been a few exceptions where, where there were lights in areas that were never forecasted to be lit up, if you will, but there's a few areas of, of major concern that needed to be de dealt with. And so this is the third of such instance to come up and be presented to council. Um, and that's where it would fall in. So the the different approach is something that we've started for say Mount Uniac where we're going to explore a larger plan where there isn't a, uh, an expanded street light zone, but that's where that will likely go based on how Mount Uniac's growing and all the new subdivisions. There's gonna be new subdivisions light, lit up next to old subdivisions that aren't and, and roadways connecting them. So it's gonna be quite a quandary, if you will. 
Um, and, and we're going to need to create a plan around that. I don't forecast major growth uh, in the specific area of the Goss Bridge light that would have such a, a more detailed review. So it's, it's, it's a one-off, it's a council decision that that's how we've set it up as uh, if council deems this to be an exceptional circumstance and not something that you're gonna look at at really building out a light network in the area anytime soon, then, then this is the right approach. So, um, but that's the prerogative of council. So the area doesn't have any safety light uh, right. reserve or anything? No. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hebb. Thank you, Madam Warden. Uh, as it stated, it's stated, it's uh, there for safety of the traveling public. And I think if we truly want to assess this properly, there should be a flashing light put there. And I understand that that would have to go through DOT in order to put that in. It wouldn't be the municipality's responsibility, but for me, I would like to see a request put in by this municipality to have that light put in there as a safety light before we spend the money and, and put a light in there where they may deem this as a possibility where it should be a, 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 a flashing light there. So um, that would be my suggestion that that was the way we should be going. And if they do not want to put a flashing light in, then we can go back and, and, and put that the street light in there. But I think the, you know we should investigate what see if TRR would put a flashing light in there before we, we, we proceed with a, with a uh, street light there. Thank you. Deputy Warden. Thank you, Madam Warden. Um, I agree with Councillor Hebb uh, on the way forward is that there should be a flashing light. But I, and I also agree that, that there needs to be some sort of light there. Uh, being funded uh, by the general tax rate when lights go up in other communities for safety lights, they're funded by an area rate even though they are for safety at, at intersections that are well-traveled or bridges that are, that, that are similar to this one. So the, the funding source to me is, is a bit of a sticker um, because there's plenty of other areas that are funding lights, uh, safety lights out of their local area rates as well. But I do agree with Councillor Hebb and I would support that. We should go to the Department of Public Works first to get a true safety light uh, flashing light to warn people as they approach the bridge. Councillor Kingley. Uh, through the chair to staff, um, what is the likelihood that uh, Public Works would agree to a flashing light, or do you have any idea? Through Madam Warden. Um, uh, at this time, I don't have a good technical answer for you. What, uh, as I'm not familiar with the province's criteria for a flashing warning signal, what they, what I can tell you is that that the province would go through a very um, by the books appro approach and review. They would look at traffic, um, traffic counts, uh, distances. Site, site planes, uh, and they would make a determination based on that so it's consistent across the province and, th and they would make a call and it wouldn't be a judgment, it would just be a straightforward yes or no based on a, a mathematical equation they would complete. Um, I, I don't have a, a good sense of probability either way. Uh, I could just talk to their process at this point. point. Do you have any sense for how long it would take to go through that type of process? Oh. Um, <coughs> Through Madam Warden, the, the the length of time, if a request goes in, it really depends on on um, availability of provincial staff. I'd be I, honestly, I'd be shocked if it took longer than three months, um, based on historic responses. We've done uh, requests for technical reviews of intersections, and the way that that they are looked at from a technical perspective, they, they deploy their team rather quickly to do that and set up counts and it's part of their ongoing operating expense to do that type of work. So I don't think it'd be a lengthy uh, process to, to have that request go through. Okay, that's it. Councillor Garden-Cole. Thank you, Madam Warden. 
Um, through you to staff, being in a more urban area, uh, I'm not familiar with uh, safety lights. So would a safety light take the place of a street light for approaching uh, vehicles coming to light up the, uh, the area that we're referring to? Uh, through you, Madam Warden, a uh, safety light is a street light. So it's just uh, funded differently because it doesn't fall within our policy. So it's not like a flashing light or anything. It's just no. a street light? Correct. But the safety light that we're talking about asking transportation to do is a flashing light. Well, that's what I'm trying so, to clarify. So through you, Madam Warden, the, that would be a different light. And if it was deemed required... Um, the province would likely install and pay for it on a, a a blinking yellow indicator light on the side of the road. That would be something the province would do as per um, um, traffic standards versus the light that is in question for the motion on our municipal safety light. Our municipal safety lights are only street lights. Okay. So what, we're, what the vote in on is today is to spend dollars to put in a street light that's outside of the street light policy. That's why we call it a, a safety light. Okay, and what I'm, in my head, I'm wondering if this flashing safety light that the province may or may not put in, would it do the same job as the street light that we're looking at putting in as far as lighting up the way for oncoming traffic? Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, through Madam Ward, I would say it would, it wouldn't, it would achieve something different. And so a flashing indicator provides a cue for alertness for the driver uh, in a different way than just lighting up an area creates more visibility. So a light creates visibility in the opportunity versus a direct blinking indicator. It, it, it is intentionally trying to attract a driver's attention versus a light provides the opportunity for more detail for someone that is paying attention. If that differentiator makes sense. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Councillor McPhee. I'm trying. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Warden. Yes, uh, my first thoughts when I read about this was a flashing red light would seem to be the appropriate thing. I assume what we're the safety issue is people coming up 236 from the Goss Bridge approaching the T intersection with 215. And if that's the case, then a flashing red light pointing towards those folks would warn them that they were coming up to an intersection. Um, maybe I have that wrong, that what the intention is, but it seemed to me that would be it. And I would reference... Uh, where the Department of Transportation or Public Works now uh, put a red light where routes 236 and 289 come together. So they had the same problem at that intersection there. That's near South Maitland, but on the uh, Colchester side of the uh, bridge. So uh, I wonder if that wouldn't be the proper route to go is to try to get Public Works to put in a flashing red light warning people on 236. You're coming to a T intersection, you better be prepared to stop. Anyway, that's my feelings. Thank you. Councilor Rhino. Yeah, there's more compounding issues than just uh, traffic coming there. There's issues of walkers. Walkers come down that hill and they walk through that, across that intersection and coming, vice versa, coming the other way. And with no light there at all, you cannot see them. And there's been several near misses at that intersection. So that's compounding this also. Which would a safety light give more visibility to walkers in that area? This is this is what I'm tr what I'm trying to get at. And as far as you know, your your flashing amber lights. I know for a fact that it goes to your goes to your area manager. Your area manager then has to run it through the district traffic supervisor, and analysis is done, and then it comes back that way. And then, and then after much time, then it would, if passed, re, re, uh, be passed on to uh, Nova Scotia Power, and you're at their whim. And I know for a fact personally that I've done one in 
uh, a section of Colchester in my area that I that I look after, and it was almost two years to get some things done. So, so the the fact with the say with the, the safety light is the fact that it will protect walkers who do walk in that area, and this is what this is the compounding issue. There, thank you. Deputy Warden. Thank you, uh, Madam Warden, and, and uh, thanks for the clarification to Councilor Ron. Like, you know, the, the intent of the light is for the walkers and it's for the residences, right? So it's, it's a benefit to those residents, and that's why funding from the general tax rate should not be used to, for this. The safety lights that are used for the similar types of, of safety for walkers and, and people at intersections in other areas of the municipality are paid for by the residents that benefit from it. And that's why, because it's coming from the general tax rate, I can't support this. Councillor Musa. Uh, the deputy warden stole my word. I agree 100% with him. Thank you. Councillor Rhino. Well, I guess where I can understand where the deputy warden's thinking, but it's also for the protection of the motorist who who several motors from all over. That's a through way through there to the Windsor area and down through there. It does, will, would protect anybody walking the area, but it also protects the motoring public from striking anybody in that area or, or would go towards that. Because uh, even a light will not guarantee that this would go on. But uh, uh, that's, uh, that's what we're, what, we're trying to accomplish here in this area. And then it would have added benefit of, of adding, lighting up that intersection uh, totally and giving more help to the motoring public uh, that way also. Thank you. Councilor Head. Thank you, Madam Warden. I think everybody's been by the cheese factory corner and there's two lights there, one red and one amber. One amber one is coming from West Union Road. The red one comes from Kenny Cook Way. Down on South Rodden, there's a four way, four roads come, or two roads come on to two, or 14. There's a flashing yellow one there. Having a street light there for walkers, I can understand that. I, I, I understand where that's coming from. But as Councillor Rhino just, just said, that it, it's also for the traveling public. If you're coming from the Goss Bridge down there and you're not familiar with the road, uh, there's not too much to stop you there but a guardrail. And if you're walking, you're very visible to see the cars coming one way or another. So you, as a walker, you can make your decision whether you want to walk across or not. But if you're driving a car or any kind of a vehicle come down there and you're not familiar with the road, you can definitely get right across. There's a guardrail and there's a big bank with water on the other side. So. Um, yeah, I think a flashing light is no doubt the best thing, uh, but a street light is not going to alleviate the traffic problem. It's only going to alleviate maybe the help with the, with the walkers there. So I think by putting a flashing light there would, would be more beneficial to the walkers and the traveling public too. So thank you. Councilor Rhino. Well, I just want to point out that I seen this no different than what we approved for Kennecoke there other than to have to run a little bit more wire. The, I think the, the one in Kennecook went at the 236, uh, 354 intersection there with the same, pretty near the same uh, idea, a T intersection, right? And, and, and it, it was approved. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Okay, counselors, I have no one left to speak. We do have a motion on the floor. The choices are to vote on the motion that stands on the floor. We've heard discussion about a different kind of light by the province. We could move to table the motion that's on the floor. And uh, after either one of those is done, whether we vote on this motion or we table it, we could then have a motion to um, request a flashing light if that was the will of council at that location. So. I leave it up to you, Council. Uh, what is your wish? Do you wish to call for the question or to table, or what do you wish to do? The question on the motion has been called.
And the motion is passed by a vote of 7 to 3 with uh, Deputy Warden, Councillor Head, and Councillor Musso voting nay. I just have a question before we move on to finance staff, perhaps. It seems that part of the discomfort with this was it being on the general rate. Is would this be something that would be eligible to be paid for the installation part out of the community building fund or the former gas tax fund where it does similar to sidewalks, safety things like that? You'd have to look into it. Yeah. I mean, I would have, we do have what was previously known as gas tax money, and I, I wouldn't have an objection to the slightly under $5,000 coming out of the rural gas tax, if that would alleviate some of the concern for council if it were an eligible project. So I just throw that out there. Maybe staff could look into that. We use gas tax for we have, That's what we have to use for all of them. Yeah. We have to use yes. gas tax. It is eligible. So it is eligible. So, um, okay, Councillor, the motion has passed as it is on the general rate, but Councillor Musa. Yeah, I was going to say that we always use the general tax rate for our safety light, so. The general gas yeah. tax. Yeah, yeah, the gas tax, yeah. So as the motion is passed, it's on the general rate. I just leave it out there if any councillor wanted to make a motion to take it out of the uh, rural gas tax reserves. Um, that could be done. Deputy Warden? I would move that, that the funding source be used, taken out of the rural community, Canada Community Building Fund or former gas tax fund uh, to, a, to align with the practice being used in other areas in municipality. Seconded by Councillor Musa. Councillor Rhino. Well, I don't have a problem with it. We're coming to the rural gas tax fund, but I, I, I guess could, we just passed a motion that it went through the through uh, uh, the general rate. And it's just, I don't know if that. This you know, motion simply changes that direction in the first motion. I guess I, I would ask if, if, if that's procedurally correct to just pass a motion on the general rate and then turn around and then put it onto an, another, uh, another rate. And along with that, what would happen to the one that's previously already in Kennecook and then I think there's another one apparently from what I read in the report in Maitland and I'm not aware of where that was. So. Well, I think this motion simply refers to the cost of installation of this one and mm -hmm. I think the consternation was because it was a higher cost than the other ones. Uh, I would think it would be in order. It would be simply like any other motion that was made to do any project, and council has the ability to change the source of funding at any time. So I, so would, I guess then where would uh, uh, the installation aside, where would the general funding come from of the general rate to out of the roads and, and thing to uh, operate the, uh, the, the said light? Uh, CAO can answer that. Through Madam Warren, the current structure we have in place for the two lights that already exist, it is funded through the Roads Cost Center on the general tax rate. Uh, the operating costs for those street lights are very minimal on a monthly basis. It's a few mm -hmm. dollars a month, so um, it would be funded through the general tax rate because we don't have another method to fund it. So how would, I guess through, if I have still have the two floor, how would that one in Kinnickel be paid? There was no special funds went in for that? that we, where, did that where did that one go come from? Uh, through you, Madam Warden, those two lights were funded through the transportation general tax rate budget because for the same reasons as your discussion earlier, there is no area rate to fund those lights. So I guess what would be the difference in the cost? Uh, roughly, if you could remember. I don't remember those two being different than the standard street lights that we had at the time, so they probably were around that $1,000 mark for installation. So in all fairness, then, if we took that 3378 out of gas, then, the, then everything would be treated fairly. Then. You know what I'm saying? Uh, through you, Madam Warden, I think the, the conversation is around the other areas who have put in streetlights in their um, intersections have paid the $1,000 or $1,100 from their area rate funds or their, or their regional gas tax fund. 
Um, so I think that's the comparison in question, not really with the two lights that were put in. And that was years ago that those other lights have been put in. Um, to well, my I mind, the, the comparison being drawn to is between the intersections at major intersections through Mount Uniac, for example, have the area rate or gas taxes paid for the installation of those lights. But what about the one in Kinnegal? Because that, that was borne by the general rate, correct? That was, and it, um, through Madam Warren, it may have, it was years ago that that light was put in. Um, I'm not even sure there was a pot for rural gas tax at the time. Mm -hmm. Like I say, if it's procedurally correct, I don't have a problem. If if no other councilor in the rural area has a problem of coming out of the uh, coming out of the rural gas, that's fine. But I just want to be procedurally correct. Well, I'm going to rule that the motion is in order because it uh, it simply changes the source of funding of a project established by a previous motion. And we have done that in the past. You know, we've had motions to do projects and borrow money and discovered we've had reserves, so we've had motions to change the source of funding, and I view this as the same. Okay, the motion is on the floor. Anyone else wishing to speak on the motion? Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary. Motion is carried. We will now move doors. on to Parks, Recreation, and Culture Committee. Over to you, Councillor Rhino. The committee held its regular meeting June the 20th, 2023, in Council Chambers. The following motions are coming forward as a result of that meeting. Shubenacadie Ball Field Softball Agreement. East Dance Minor Softball Association has requested to use the ball field for practices and games for the remainder of the 2023 season as per council uh, season. As per council motion, this request is coming forward to council for decision. So from that, the Parts and Recreation and Culture Committee recommends that council give the CAO direction to enter into a usage agreement with the East Dance Minor Softball for use of the ball field at the Shubenacadie River Park. Mr. Chair of the committee, I do so move. Seconded. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Questions been called. We're missing a voter. And the motion is passed unanimously. District Recreation Fund Second Intake. Five applications were received and presented to the Executive Committee. Councillor discussed uh, committing available funds to cover the entire project costs. So from that, the Parks, Recreation and Culture Committee recommends that Council approve the following District Recreation Funds for 2023-2024 Intake Number 2. Lions Memorial Park from District 3, 5,750, and that is your total. Milford Recreation Association from District 2, 7,400. From District 3, 8,973. Dist from District 7, 3,427 for a total of $19,800. E.H. Horn Preservation Society from District 1, 7,648. And from District 10, 6,301 for a total of $13,949. The East Gore Community Club, District 3, Milford Nine, Milford, Nine Mile River Gore, One Cent Levy, uh, $8,351. District 11, Rodden Gore, One Cent, $3,942 for a total of $12,293. Empire Trails Association, District 11 Gore, uh, one cent fund, $3,058. From District 11, $12,500 for a total of $15,558. The total funding, uh, total funding and all the above, 60, $67,358. As chair of the committee, I so move. 
Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Questions, Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. Number three, the East Ants Aquatic Center program registration. Following registration is uh, of seasonal programs. Some East Ants residents have indicated issues with enrolling in programs at the East Ants Aquatic Center. Some residents feel that there should be a priority registration for East Ants residents. Others that feel a facility membership <coughs> holder should have priority registration. Staff presented an analysis of the number of East Ants residents in aquatic programs versus residents outside the municipality, as well as the results of jurisdictional scan on priority registration models in Nova Scotia and across Canada. Committee members discussed the pros and cons of the priority registration. So from all that discussion, the Parks, Recreation and Culture Committee recommends that Council maintains the current registration model of for aquatics and recreational programs that does not prioritize registration for East Hans residents or membership holders at the East Hans Aquatic Center. As chair of the committee, I do so move. We have a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Musa. Discussion on the motion, Councillor Garden Cole. Uh, thank you, Madam Warden. Um, yeah, I just want to say I won't be supporting this. I was disappointed that um, we weren't able to look into uh, not necessarily uh, cutting off, you know, or having a, uh, a registration open to um, our residents first and then residents outside the municipality, but maybe looking into some way that we could accommodate people closer to our uh, municipality. When you look at, I think, 52% of registrants for uh, swimming lessons outside of the municipality, um, it's understandable that residents would, would uh, be concerned about that. I know just from personal experience with chatting with people um, beside me over the last number of years that uh, were from Bedford or Sackville in particular and came to our facility for no other reason than that they just wanted to come to the new facility. They were literally driving past facilities very close to them in order to drive out two hours. So I was hoping that maybe we could look into, you know, accommodating people within so many kilometers of the border, that kind of thing. So um, just, just uh, disappointed that we weren't able to, you know, look outside the box and, and come up with something that would be a little bit more acceptable to our residents. Thank you. Any further discussion? <coughs> Questions been called. And the motion is passed by a vote of eight to two with Councillor Rhino and Councillor Garden Cole voting nay. Back to you, Councilor uh, Number four, East Tennis Arena Association's uh, sports plec request to increase rates. Mr. Scott Forward, general manager of the East Tennis Sports Plex, gave a presentation to committee on the current <coughs> financial status of the facility and noted the East Hans Arena Association board is requesting permission to increase, increase facility rates. Discussion was held regarding the impacts of COVID-19 programming and potential revenue streams and budgeting. So from the, from the discussion, the Parts Recreation and Culture Committee recommends a council direct the East Ham Sportsplex General Manager to provide staff with the 2018 financial statements and budget to compare to the current year for the purpose of bringing, bringing a staff report to committee in July. As chair of the committee, I do so move. Seconded by Councillor Mitchell. Is there any discussion on the motion? Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. Back and, to you. And number five, should be River Ball Park Ball Field. The Parts Recreation and Culture Committee recommend the council move forward with outfitting the Shubenacadie River Park ball field with outlets to provide power for community events, installation which to be paid 
four from the Shubenacki Recreation Fund Reserve. As chair, uh, as chair of the committee, I move the adopt. No, I so move. Yeah, this motion would be redundant because we've already approved that at the policy meeting. If you read the next part, so. Okay, council gave gave approval by motions during the council and procedural policy meeting on June 20, 2013. No further motions are required. All right, that brings an end to that one. As chair, that brings an end to my report. As chair of the committee, I move the adoption of it. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. On to remind it, motion is carried. We now go to the Fire Advisory Committee. Uh, Councillor Green is uh, at the graduation at Hans North. Who is the deputy chair of that committee? Councillor Mitchell. I have the report here. Do you have a copy of it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's I'll read it on the screen. Okay. Go ahead. Fire Advisory Oops, let me turn your mic on, Councillor. Go ahead. Fire Advisory Committee report to Municipal Council. The committee held its regular meeting on June 1st, 2023. The following motions are coming forward as a result of that meeting. Number one, fire department re-registration. Registration forms have been received from all departments, including servicing East Hans and the staff review confirmed all departments are compliant with the requirements. Committee members had no concerns about any of the registrations. The Fire Advisory Committee recommends that Council approve the annual registration of all fire departments serving East Ends. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Seconded. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Questions. Questions from call. <clears throat> and the motion is passed unanimously. Number two, introductions. <clears throat> Mr. Clarkson formally welcomed Chief Tyler Dauphiny to the committee. Mr. Dauphiny has replaced Mr. Noble on the committee as East End's Fire Service representative. Mr. Clarkson then introduced Mr. Jeff McDonald. Mr. McDonald is the manager of accounting for East End's and is responsible for the accounting functions the municipality performs for the fire departments. <clears throat> Number three, Municipal Long Service Medal. Chief Darby, Uniac Fire Department, requested that committee consider adding a section to the annual registration form that would allow chiefs to include the names of those in their department that will be eligible for a long service award in the coming year. This would eliminate a separate process for collecting that information. The committee agreed with the suggestion. The Fire Advisory Committee recommends that council approve a change to the registration form to include a section for the chief to list the names of members eligible for a long service award in the coming year. As chair of the committee, I so move. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Question. Questions been called. <coughs> and the motion is passed unanimously. <coughs> Number four or five. Oh, sorry. Councilor Rhino. I guess I had uh, some quite a little bit, a little bit of concern regarding how, in what year you recognize for awards. Uh, without naming <coughs> names, there was there was a person who had uh, felt they were awarded uh, the the, mo uh, the year in which they were in, which I thought was last year. With regard, it ended up it's going to be a year. Your your year backward, I guess, is 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 that right through you? To, I guess, Adam. I think we're talking about the ten and fifteen year medals that the municipality. Well, these have. are long service awards, which would I would include that would be long service awards over the twenty and twenty five, wouldn't it? No, those are not the awards that we're talking about. I don't believe, but Adam. Yeah, through you, Madam Warden, um, the Fire Advisory Committee were speaking to the 10 and 15 years, specifically the municipal uh, long service awards. Um, the report, I guess, could, could have clarified that it was the 10 and 15 year, um, not the uh, annual ones that are done through the province or 
uh, the other levels of government. I think the the answer, though, long and short, would be the same process. Um, is that uh, a fire member, fire service member, is recognized um, when they've completed their full year of service? So if it's ten years, once they've uh, and we've been using the fiscal, not the fiscal, the calendar year end of December thirty first, uh, if they've completed their ten years within that period uh, pr prior to that, then they would be eligible for that ten year award. So if a member is nine and a half years at December 31st, they would then be eligible once they've completed their full 10 years. Okay, but I want to clarify, it would be the same thing as what I'm talking about, is if, if that member within that year gains their 10 year or 15 or whatever year award, would not that, that wait be done the next calendar year? You would have 10 to 15 full years of service? Correct. Okay, so if this year somebody gets 15, it is their 15th year anniversary, they cannot receive that until the following year. Yeah, uh, three amount of more, and I guess when we look at the fire service as a whole, there's 330 plus members. So um, from a process perspective, I, I can appreciate that, you know, January 1st, a member may have hit their 10 year mark and they, you know, maybe almost on year 11 by the time they receive their medal, absolutely, they're waiting a, a full year, um, but from a process perspective, we've, we've uh, utilized that December 31st council, or sorry, December 31st calendar year end as the kind of the process mechanism to determine to determine that. So, you know, and out of those members, um, you know, fire departments may do sign-ons every month of the year, and then as they've reached that threshold, um, it would be quite challenging to administer uh, those medals on a month-by-month -month basis. Mm -hmm. So as, as of December 31st, if you had somebody that reached their 15 or 10 or 15 year thing, they would receive that the following presentation year. I just want to clarify that. Correct. And, there, and there's two pieces to this three, Madam Warren. There's the, the long service awards that go in conjunction with the annual um, volunteer recognition event. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, speaking with PRC, that is the threshold, the benchmark they are using as, as well from a process. So it does align with the 10 and 15 year model uh, that we're doing out of corporate services as well. So when the chiefs fill out this, these application forms to put that down, they will be aware of that process? <coughs> Correct. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, three amount of more. And I'll, just, I'll just add. I think maybe there was a, a hiccup a few years ago where maybe a member was in mid mid year that received it before they had hit the the threshold. So I, I can see where maybe the, the questions uh, coming from. But I think we have a really good process established at a staff level. Uh, number four, fireworks. Councilor Mitchell heard from a concerned resident and asked if there is a possibility of banning fireworks given the dry conditions and the number of wildfires in the province right now. Councillor Green co commented that fireworks are included when a provincial ban fire ban is in place. A brief discussion was held and it was agreed no further action is required. As chair of the committee, I move the adoption of this report. Seconded. Okay, moved and seconded. I'm going to come back to Councillor Garden Cole. She has a question following this. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary, motion Aye, is carried. Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Madam Warden. Um, through you to staff, so just wondering, typically we do this time of year, we're putting uh, fireworks friendly messages out on uh, our uh, social media and in our, uh, is it too late to put it in our seasonal uh, newsletter? Okay. How about whatever our, on our website, social media, whatever, whatever we can. It can be the same message as last year. And also um, pointing out to people, because a lot of people don't realize that when there's a fire ban on, that includes fireworks. So that really needs to be. And those little, um, you know, neighbor-friendly fireworks messages that we've been putting out the last couple of years. That would be great. Thank you. Councillor Mitchell. Yes, going back to introductions, I make a, I make a motion to have a Mr. McNoble receive a, uh, a thank you card for his service to the East Ends Fire Service. Has that been done already, or? 
We think we did, but we're not sure, and we'll check into it. In a okay, I just uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'll leave it with you. Councilor Head. Yeah, Madam Chair, I think we sent a, a letter of thank you from the Police Advisory Board, but I don't think no, we he did. He wasn't on Police Advisory. Or, excuse me, the, the Fire Advisory Board, uh, but I don't think we did the Long Service Award. I think uh, I think Councillor Mitchell was simply looking for a thank you letter to Mr. Noble for his years of service on the um, yeah on the fire advisory. Yeah. Oh, I thought you said on the the fire service committee. That's what you said. I thought. Okay. Well, so is it agreed with Council that we'll investigate whether Mr. Noble <laughs> has received the thank you letter and we'll follow up because okay. it'll certainly be thank you. Okay. Pardon? It was sent in November of last year. Okay. All right, moving along, we have the nominating committee meeting, so I will turn the chair over to the deputy warden. Go ahead, warden. The committee held a meeting on June the 20th, 2023, in room 168. The following motion is coming forward as a result of this meeting. Audit Committee Public Members. Three applications were received from members of the public to be a member of the Audit Committee to fill a vacancy for two-year term. Applications were reviewed by the Manager of Finance, the Director of Finance, and by the Nominating Committee. The Nominating Committee recommends that Council appoint Mr. David McCusker as a public member of the Audit Committee for a term ending July 31st, 2026 and that the new member will commence participation in the Audit Committee after the Council meeting on June 28, 2023. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. And the votes are in, and it's passed unanimously. Oh, as chair of the committee, I move the adoption of this report. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Back to you, Warden. Well, back to you, Deputy <laughs> Warden, as I'll do my Warden's report. Um, and I will, uh, I, it was a very busy month. I will attempt to be brief as I touch on the highlights. Um, I did attend the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Conference in Toronto from May 24th to 29th. We had presentations from federal leaders. Uh, I did a heritage tour of a St. Lawrence neighborhood in, uh, in Toronto, um, attended the Atlantic Caucus as well as the uh, Nova Scotia meeting, attended workshops on inter-community transit, uh, Canada's agricultural se sector, a session on rural communities, a uh, session on housing, and a session on new fiscal framework for municipalities among, those are just a few things <laughs> during those days. On uh, June the 1st, myself and the deputy warden uh, and the CAO and some st senior staff met with uh, the uh, mayor of uh, West Hans Regional Municipality and some of his senior staff here at our municipal office. Uh, we met in the uh, meeting room at the Aquatic Center. Uh, we just wanted to review um, commonalities, things that perhaps we could work together on. And out of that, one thing that we are going to uh, try and work together on is the tourism signage along the 215. And I think we came away with an agreement that, uh, you know, if we have an opportunity to pursue common interests, that Hance County as a whole carries a bit more clout than either East or West Hants alone. So was, I thought, a, a good meeting. Uh, from June the 8th to the 10th, I attended the Atlantic Mayor's Congress in Amherst. Um, there were sessions around uh, civility and politics, particularly for female members of, of, of councils and, and other politics. Uh, I was shocked. I mean, I get the odd message or email or whatever that I find just a, maybe borderline. Nothing like what, uh, for example, the uh, mayor of Moncton, uh, 
said she has restraining orders on, on a number of people at any given time. She pulled up her email and read us an email that she had received that day. And I have never in my life received anything that offensive from anyone. And I'll leave it at that. So I think we've all noticed that there seems to be a lot of anger and hostility at times out there. And I guess that's everywhere. And it's worse in some places than, than others, obviously. Um, also, um, we had discussion and a, an excellent uh, presentation around the uh, risk to the Chignecto Isthmus from uh, Mr. Bill Casey. Um, we had uh, some more um, discussion around basic income, and there was a motion passed in support of a pilot project around basic income. While I would personally have supported the motion that went forward, I didn't feel that I was able to support it at the Congress because I didn't feel we had had the discussion at our council, and I felt that I was there representing uh, my council. There were a couple of other people there from Nova Scotia who felt the same way, uh, uh, the mayor of CBRM and uh, the mayor of Kings County, along with the uh, CAO of NSFM. And, uh, so while we all said we might personally support it, that we didn't feel we had a mandate to vote in the positive on that. Uh, some folks there thought we could just leave the room so it would be a unanimous vote, but we didn't do that. Um, we also had a presentation, very interesting, from LED roadway lighting. And uh, I know that those of us at FCM received lots of information about the wonderful things they can do on top of these lights now. And I know the CAO has that information as well. On June the 12th, uh, I met with, uh, along with, um, I'm trying to remember who was at each of these meetings. And please forgive me if I forget. But myself. Um, the CAO, who else met with the Sportsplex board? Uh, Alana, and uh, Councillor Mitchell, and uh, Councillor Tingley, and uh, Director of Finance, uh, Wade Tatry, uh, met with the Sportsplex board. Uh, I think we had some good discussion there around uh, the operating agreement and, and, you know, how things were we're running and trying to get aligned to everyone being on the same page and, and of the same understanding. And I think it was following that discussion that uh, Mr. Forward came in and made his presentation as well. June 21st was National Indigenous Peoples Day and I did attend the walk from the former residential school site in Shubenacadie to the Shuby River Park. Um, Councillor McPhee was there, Councillor Mitchell was there, uh, myself, and Councillor Tingley. I don't think I missed anyone. And we had a number of staff members present uh, who were had set up a comfort station type thing to hand out bottled water and, and so forth for the walk. And it was, uh, it, it was uh, I think, a, a good afternoon. Um, and I, I'm always moved when I visit that site, and I was pleased to be able to attend that this year. Uh, following that, then uh, I went to the uh, sod turning for CCOA in the business park, and a number of other councillors were able to attend there as well. Um, Councillor Tingley, myself, Councillor Mitchell, Councillor Hebb. Did I miss anyone? Councillor, yes, Councillor Garden Cole. So uh, anyway, and that was very well attended. It was uh, very exciting to see that group be able to, you know, officially start that project. There were a number of clients uh, present, and um, it was the atmosphere was electric. It was, you know, joyful for lack of a better word. So uh, anyway, and of course there were representatives from the provincial and federal uh, governments there as well. So it was really good to see how. Um, you know, the three levels of government working together can make good, impactful things happen. So, anyway, 
On June 24th, uh, at uh, Councillor Mitchell's invitation, I attended the Elmsdale Fire Department banquet, as along with uh, Councillor Garden Cole. I will recommend to any of you, should you score an invitation to this event, please accept it. You will not regret it. Um, I truly enjoyed myself. It was not a formal banquet. It was very informal, a barbecue type. More food than any one person could eat in two or three or four days. But uh, it, was, um, uh, it was a very enjoyable evening, and I thank the Councillor Mitchell and the department for the, in, for the invitation. Also, I'd like to recognize tonight that this is our... She's not here with us tonight. She was here earlier for the audit committee meeting at our longtime uh, director of finance, Ms. Sue Surratt, has retired after many years service. She came to us in 2007, and this is 2023, so that would be about 16 years that Sue has been with the municipality. Um, her financial guidance and advice has certainly... Uh, contributed a great deal to the wonderful position, the solid financial position the municipality's in and, and the the great the great shape that the municipality's in is a good place to live and work as well. And I just uh, like to publicly thank, even though she's not here in person, I'd like to publicly recognize and thank Ms. Sue Surratt for her invaluable contributions over the years and uh, the mantle has been passed to the very capable hands of our new director and uh, onward we go and we certainly wish Sue all the best in her retirement. So I don't know if I've missed anything. I may well have. If I have, I apologize, but uh, thank you very much. Counselors. Thank you, Warden. Does anybody have a question? Any questions for the Warden on his report? See no questions, and I'm sure uh, Sue was watching on live stream and will appreciate that. Back to you, Ward. Thank you, Deputy Ward. Uh, okay, next we'll go to business from councillors, and I do not remember where I started last time, so I'm going to start with Councillor Musa this time. No, I'm going to start with Councillor Musa and go that way. I like to shake things up once in a while. That was a surprise. Thank you, Madam Warden. Uh, I have, uh, first I start with Jesse. Uh, I want to thank you for the letter for the East Uniac Road, and I see some progress over there. you have any idea what's going on? <laughs> A lot of people asking, and I didn't have any uh, answer. Uh, through Madam Warden, I, I had heard there had been some survey stakes out and some markings on roads, but I don't have a direct update. Uh, we did we did reach out. I haven't been able to connect to Public Works to find out what is exactly going on. But uh, I'll continue to f to look into that. But uh, uh, any up upgrades to uh, road structures in the area would be <coughs> greatly beneficial. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that's it for now. Thanks. So we temporarily lost Councillor Tingley, so we'll come back to him. We will move Councillor Rhino. Thank you, Madam Warden. Uh, this past weekend, I had the pleasure of presenting two certificates, one to Mr. Frank Dixon from Upper Kennecook on uh, his uh, attainment of his 90th year. Uh, a party was held. Uh, I, I didn't make the party, but I did uh, catch up to him for his, med uh, for his certificate presentation. Also, uh, I attended uh, Sunday, an 80th birthday for uh, Mrs. Claire Tanner, who resides in Maitland, and uh, there was a turnout at the fire hall and well received. Uh, I think it was late last fall or late last summer, I had asked that the monument there uh, for the heritage uh, district be cleaned. I wonder, uh, has that ever been uh, attempted to, to be done or is it in the works or uh, how far out are we? Um, to Madam Warden, I, I'm not aware that we ever have, uh, but we can certainly look into it. Yeah, I did bring that up from business from counselors and then uh, it was uh, that I had a uh, from a former counselor who brought it to my attention that uh, the stone is getting pretty shabby, and I was, I was 
thought of, I was addressed at that time that it would be taken care of probably in this year, so it must have got forgotten. So if we could have, have that cleaned up, it would be much appreciated. And also, uh, with regard to um, uh, the past fires that have taken place in the Tantallon area, uh, and the dry conditions that there was there, and, and the ones in Shelburne that uh, took place, they were substantial losses in, in, in both communities and both fires. But I guess uh, I want to bring to everyone's attention that uh, the past Fiona storm passed that blew a number of trees down in District, <coughs> District 5. And a lot of the times they were blocking the road and, and they had to be cut. Well, what still remains in the uh, DOT right of way are many trees and they're all crisscrossed over each other and in two locations that uh, that come to mind and with and they are drying out now and with the uh, conditions uh, you know with summer conditions i know it's wet we're going through a little wet period now but uh, when summer comes back again uh, we could be uh, in the uh, same position of, of a wildfire if some of these trees don't get cleaned up out of the right of way because we, you know God forbid there's people flipping cigarette butts and whatever and so on. And so I I'm, I'm, uh, would move that, uh, that uh, we uh, correspond with the uh, Department of Public Works asking them if they would look after the remaining de tree debris in their right of way, especially in the vicinity of the Shaw Smith Hill in Salma and uh, and in the low and no shore where they hit a number of trees and I can get the exact locations uh, for you and send them to you tomorrow there. But uh, it's just a number of people have brought this to my attention since these fires have taken place and, uh, and uh, yes, it, it is a definite concern. So I move that uh, we correspond with them asking them that they uh, clean these trees uh, up in there right away. We have a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Gurdon Cole. Any discussion on the motion? Questions. Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. I thank you for your support on that. And right now, that, that's uh, uh, all I have from District 5. We'll go back to Councillor Kingley now. Uh, I'm, I've attended eight events in the past month, but I'm not going to go through all this. Uh, I just basically have a motion I'd like to make tonight. Uh, there was a study uh, on trunk two, route 214 in the corridor area uh, done by TIR uh, in 2014. Um, and with, with the new residential and commercial development, increased traffic, forecasted growth, that sort of thing, I think we should uh, be proactive and update that report. That was done in 2014. Uh, I don't know what would be done on the roads uh, in the next year but, uh, or two, but in three years, I think we'll need to start uh, doing some work on those, uh, or the, the province will need to start doing some work in those areas. So I'd like to move to have a letter sent the province offering uh, the municipal support for a traffic study being conducted in the areas of Trunk 2 from Milford to Enfield and Route 214, uh, Trunk 2 to Park Road, as the municipality has valuable development <coughs> forecast information. We have a seconder. Second. Seconded by the Deputy Warden. Is there any discussion on the motion? Question. Questions been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. Anything further, Councillor Tingley? That's it. Okay. Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Madam Warden. Um, on May 27th, I attended the Enfield Elmsdale Lions Club 50th anniversary uh, banquet. Um, it was a, a good turnout, and they had several original members from the 1970s, which was uh, very inspiring. 
Um, on the 21st of June, I attended the groundbreaking of the CCOA new build in the industrial uh, park, as well as uh, the warden and some other counselors and MLAs and dignitaries and and so many supporters. It was just uh, an amazing uh, an amazing turnout, uh, clients in particular. And uh, yeah, it was a great, great day for, for CCOA and, uh, and our municipality as well. Uh, Elmsdale Fire Department on the 24th, they had their banquet um, where they gave out awards to uh, well-deserved uh, volunteer firemen, especially one in particular that got a 50-year award. Mm -hmm. uh, the dinner was just unbelievable. So yeah, hopefully I might get an invite again uh, next year. Um, <laughs> I'd uh, just like to, uh, let me see what else I've got here. Sue Surratt, the uh, Director of Finance. Um, yes, the municipality was better for her being here. Uh, she was a great Director of Finance and uh, just a lovely person. So we will definitely, definitely miss Sue going forward, but, uh, but, but we'll think of her. Um, let me see. I'd like to congratulate all the graduates graduates this time of year. I wish them a uh, enjoyable and safe week of celebration and whatever they choose to embark on going forward. Also, a um, safe summer for all the students that are uh, are finishing up their school year. I do have a uh, question for staff. Um, just wondering about the uh, Wilson, the end of Wilson Road, meeting up with Boyd. Um, and uh, if you've made any headway finding someone to uh, do some maintenance on that section of the road that is so in such uh, need of maintenance. Uh, through you, Madam Warden. Uh, from, a, from a road perspective, uh, we still have uh, tenders out for uh, getting uh, some new service providers. Uh, that said is, Spot assessments are, are happening and underway. Uh, staff have been out on Wilson and Boyd. Uh, it's not the top of the priority list of what has to be actioned first yet, but it is on the list. Um, uh, so I don't have an exact actionable time. What we're doing is, is spot repairs uh, until we can get uh, another greater option lined up, which uh, should be ideally, we'll know what we're into in the next week or, week or so the we've got uh, got those closing here this week and next week uh and th and then we'll go from there but uh uh it is on the radar of staff and uh, we're trying to pick away at it and uh things are going to get more challenging with the wet conditions that we've been having over the last week um uh this is this is prime pothole forming kind of weather on gravel roads so uh it's going to be challenging in the weeks ahead well, in my car last week, it was it was barely passable. So I um, I really feel for those residents um, uh, going forward with this weather because really I you know I I can see them having to turn around and, and go through the subdivision and go out the other way just just to avoid those potholes. They're they're unreal. Um, and the other my other question is: last time I had brought up the potential or our application for a crosswalk that was denied, and um, I thought that you know, that we could, we had made a request to the uh, um, Minister of Transportation and I wanted to reach out to them again because we didn't hear anything, but there was some, uh, you know, uh, whispers that maybe the MLA had, had gotten somewhere. Is there any update on that or should we be reaching out to the Director of, of Transportation again, looking for a response? Uh, through Madam Warden, uh, yes, there was a, a phone conversation between staff and the MLA just just to update the MLA on the topic. Um, they weren't; it wasn't it wasn't top of mind because we weren't addressing the topic directly uh, to him. Um, uh, staff did forward on the correspondence that was sent to him, asking if he could follow up with a conversation first to see if there was uh, some sway. I did. Uh, I did hear back that the way the information was sent didn't follow the right protocol, so I've got to redo that so it can be considered. But if not, and we don't hear back in a reasonable stance, we'll just send the letter. Um, so I, I've got to send the letter not in a forward of another correspondence for them to consider and officially respond, which is what our intent is, is to get an official response. So uh, I'm trying to 
navigate those protocols through the province right now, but it's it's an active topic that we're chasing. So then should I be making another a motion to reach out to the minister again? Is that what's uh, coming out of all that? Through Madam Warren, we have an open motion that we have to to action, so okay. it, it's it's open. We ha We can't stop until it's closed. Okay, that's great. That's everything from District 1. Thank you. Councillor Mitchell. It's spinning. Just okay. Thank you, Madam Ward. Now, I won't cover the uh, items that you've included me in, but I have a few. On May 23rd, uh, the FCM director's meeting was held virtually, and which I attended. I also attended the FCM in Toronto from the 24th to the 29th, and it's sad to say that I didn't get reelected as a director for this 2023-2024 year, but that's that was okay. I had, did a tell on J June the 7th, the Elmsdale Fires business meeting, and to remind them that they're dealing with taxpayers' dollars and they should be spent wisely. On June the 14th, I attended a Zoom meeting dealing with weathering what's ahead, Nova Scotia climate at risk. On June 16th, I attended a breakfast with MLA John and McDonald at the Sportsplex. And also that afternoon, I attended the AGM at the Elms Allegiant with the Community Rider Learning and Resource Center. I attended the CCOA Todd Cerning Ceremony. I thank the warden and Councillor Garden Cole and MLA John McDonald for attending the Elmsdale Annual Banquet and Awards Night. I presented on t Tuesday, which was yesterday, the Leadership Award at REC to a fine young lady, Brooke Kale. She couldn't get over the the, uh, the plaque and the, and the gift from the municipality, and she was very appreciative. Uh, last uh, evening, we had the Colchester East Asian Library Board AGM and regular board meeting, and I was a reelected ch chairperson for the following year. I had a meeting with uh, Richard Tolson, the developer who is the building is under construction on the 214 in Elmsdale near Tolson. It's 11 one bedroom units, and he's getting lots of requests for uh, rental, what the rental cost would be. Also, he showed me some designs of two properties on the other side of the street, uh, two existing homes that will be coming down as part of that development. On a personal note, I attended the Rich, Richie Gilby Car Show at the Sportsplex. As a council for the area, I had an invitation from the firm group, which is a pride was a pride event at Riverview United Church on Sunday. There was a nice video and a discussion that dealt with LGBTQ purge in the military and the RCMP. I also attended the Freedom March in Shuby. On the 15th, I had an invite to the Bridgetown Regional Community School in Bridgetown to present the Thalma Mitchell Award to the, for the boys basketball. And on the 26th, the last note is COVID-19 testing and vaccination at Elmsdale Legion, in which I got my booster. And that's all. Thank you, Councillor Mitchell. Councillor Eisner. Cheer yourself. Thank you, Madam Ward. Uh, I was went to the Enfield Lines Hall meal also. It's good to talk to some of the older people there. Uh, they have their issues with getting members, <laughs> younger ones. Uh, went to uh, went to the Enfield Fire Hall for the mental health, which uh, the government really put a big sponsor on that. They had nine employees there, and they were talking to us three councillors right here. Um, it was uh, it was quite quite the information session, and they're trying to wanting to know how much mental health we had here. I said it was quite a bit. We had a, we had our own issues with different residents, so uh, they addressed some of those questions. They were taking a lot of notes from us, and it was nice, uh, good information. Um, went to the sod turning. 
for the CCOA. It's nice to see some of the old employees we work with um, and the staff are good. Uh, there was, I'd like to ask staff a question about um, water disconnect. Uh, what's the protocol on that? I had a resident that come off night shift and had no water, so he was kind of up. So I don't know if he personally didn't get a notice or I don't know, I'm not sure about that. I know you put out some, <coughs> when you do uh, repairs. Okay, CAO, we'll take that one. Uh, uh, through you, Madam Warden, the process for water disconnections is very regulated through the URB. So we have a, a notice that goes out, we have a notice of disconnection, we have a notice that gets put on the front door of the home indicating what day it will be disconnected, the payments required to be paid in full. At any point in that process, um, up to the point where the, the tag gets put on the door, mm -hmm. the residents encouraged to call the municipal office and talk to the collection officer. The collection officer can, can enter into payment arrangements on a water bill, um, and if they're honored, they can avoid disconnection that way. So if somebody has their water disconnected. Oh, it, it was for maintenance. They were doing maintenance repair on the water. It was a disconnect, like the, there was no water for the open Oh, you don't area. mean an in, a, dis, a disconnection, you just mean service interruption. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so service interruption is a little bit different, sorry. Um, service interruption often is immediate. So if we have a leak or something that we need to repair, uh, we have no choice but to interrupt the service in the area. Right. So residents would be notified um, through our social media channels, um, sometimes through, if it's a planned, uh, they would be given notices um, that there's a planned interruption of service. Uh, but quite often, nine times out of ten, you're looking at, you know, there's a leak or a break, and our staff have to sort of isolate the break mm -hmm. um, area, which unfortunately includes, you know, terminating service for a, for a certain amount of time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I put my counselor hat on when I was <laughs> over in Halifax County side. Uh, deer on the highway said geez I'm gonna call in. and I saw that deer there a couple of times so I called Waverly office and he thanked me he said we can't do anything about deer on the road anymore lands and forest uh, so they put it to public works and public works did go and pick it up so I did call Waverly back to thank him for doing that so anyways if you see a deer on the road do that I guess <laughs> take it all <home. laughs> uh, that's that's about it appreciate it Thank you. Councillor Head. Thank you, Warden. I uh, attended the Northern Region Solid Waste Committee by Zoom on the 26th, and um, I passed on a, an email a couple days ago on um, a, motion, or a motion that was made to pass on to the regional chairs about the uh, biodegradable plastics that are going in our recycling. And it's causing a problem at the recycle at the uh, composting facility. It's plugging up the machines and causing a lot of trouble. And if this PPR program comes into effect, and whenever it does, uh, the feeling is that a lot of the producers are going to be turning to the use of biodegradable plastic packaging, which is only going to compromise the problem even more. Um, so the motion was passed on to the regional chairs committee on that topic, and we we're hoping that hoping that the province will ban all biodegradable products in the province, same as we did the plastic bags, because this is going to be a, a real problem if this happens, because the, uh, there's only certain places that do the waste uh, stuff, and, and if they have to change their machinery and stuff, it's going to be a big cost to everybody. So I just wanted to make councillors aware of that, that that's taking place. Uh, the 21st, I had a groundbreaking for the CCOA, and I also attended the mental health uh, meeting at Enfield along with uh, a couple other counselors and the director. And uh, that's basically it for me. Thank you. Councillor okay. McKay. Oh, thank you, Warden. Uh, yes, first thing we have is, of course, upcoming hay days on Saturday. Hopefully, it's dry enough, but anyway, 
we'll find out. Uh, just want to assure everybody that the car show was on. There were some rumors that the car show wasn't happening, but it is. Um, also, I'd like to mention that I don't know how many people here are familiar with the Shuby Tree. It was knocked down in Fiona, so there are commemorative t-shirts that we're selling. And they'll be available on Hay Days. Uh, and also, the Sebaganekadi Council, uh, there's a tug of war this year, and they were wondering if we... They've challenged <laughs> us? They've challenged oh. us. <laughs> and opened it up to councillors and members of staff, so... I know it's short notice, but done this before. bring it on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, good. I've been in tugs of war before, but I was much younger. <laughs> but well, anyway, perhaps we'll have some discussion amongst ourselves and see if there are staff members or counselors who feel uh, we might have been much younger, but we're a lot heavier now. We will. There's like a weight for me now. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's um, yeah something that uh, we can have a discussion with. Uh, yes, I, uh, of course, the National Indigenous Day was on uh, the 21st of June, and I attended the uh, Freedom Walk and also the uh, ceremony at the, uh, at the ceremonial site uh, near the site of the uh, old residential school. I thought it was very moving, and uh, I very much liked the prayer uh, that uh, day. I kind of... I think wish more people would understand that uh, if we want Mother Earth to support us, we have to support Mother Earth. And uh, I hear a lot of ground about carbon taxes and everything, but if we don't start doing something well, we don't have to worry much longer. Anyway, <laughs> i also like to mention that uh, two other people that were there were former councillors McGinnis and uh, Knockwood that day. It was nice to see them there. And uh, the Freedom Walk was very well attended, and it was a nice uh, reception afterwards at the uh, Shuby River Community Park. Um, and attended, of course, the public information meetings, uh, the development, the changes uh, in Shubenacti, so to allow development by uh, Mr. Langell and also uh, the Stillman uh, property in Milford, so there was quite a good discussion on that. I thought the meeting went very well. Um, a lot of good questions or comments on it, but everybody stayed respectful, so that was uh, very nice. And uh, that's pretty much it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, would you have a number of people that would be needed for a tug of Six. Three we women, have, three men. We have one <laughs> so far. <laughs> it's a... Uh, yes. Three women, three men is what they're looking for. All right. Well, we, we have one male volunteer so far. So far. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Warden Harry. You saw me click it, right? You saw me do it. <laughs> there we go. It's all good now. Thank you, Warden. Um, I'll just say... Uh, I attended the SCM as well, many events. The warden listed many of them off. That I attended the same ones, some of the same ones. It was a good conference. There was some, uh, it's always good to talk to people from across the country, whether it's in the central part of Canada, on the prairies, and uh, find that we all face some of the same challenges that are going on. I had the, uh, the honor of representing East Hants um, at the naming of the rink at the West Hants Sportsplex, the John Parrish Jr. rink. Uh, for those of you who don't know who John Parrish is, um, he, he is a, a, an individual uh, that created hockey history on many, on many occasions. Uh, he was the first black coach in professional hockey, the first black GM of pro professional hockey, and as a young hockey player, a scout for the Montreal Canadiens named Scotty Bowman, traveled 17 hours on a train to watch him play in Windsor, Nova Scotia. And uh, he, his nickname was the Chocolate Rocket. And he was uh, an outstanding player. If it was not for uh, some medical issues, he, you, you might know him a little bit better. But uh, a great man, uh, very good. If you ever hear him speak, uh, he, he's a sports psychologist. Uh, he's, he's a very interesting uh, individual and a well-deserved honor uh, naming the rank. It was, a, it was a packed house and it was um, something that will be good for the legacy in Windsor. And 
even though it's Windsor's and West Hants, the majority of, of uh, well, actually all the hockey players in Mount Uniac have to play in West Hants. So a large <coughs> contingent was there. I had the honor to present the, leadership, the East Hants Leadership Award to Emma Berger at the Uniac District School Leadership Awards and uh, outstanding young woman. Uh, she's active in the school, active in sport, and uh, is one heck of a ringette player. Attended the West Hants meeting uh, with the warden, uh, with, with, their, with their mayor and uh, some of the senior staff. A lot of commonalities were, were identified and then there was a lot of differences identified. So we kind of know where, you know, things kind of mesh a little bit better between the two of us. The uh, Mount Uniac held their annual fireman's fair on the 75th anniversary of the Uniac Volunteer Fire Department. Well attended, beautiful day. Uh, all the rides were free as part of the 75th anniversary celebrations. And it was great to see the community as the second year of the parade coming back post COVID, it's starting to grow again. Uh, appreciate the, uh, the attendance from other fire departments. Uh, I believe Gore this year won best fire truck in the parade. And the uh, Colchester East Hance Library Branch Mount Uniac won best overall float. The theme this year was Carnival and they had plenty of clowns and everything else going along and it was, it, it was really nice. Had a meeting, uh, got, a, got, got a call to go meet uh, MLA Brad Johns, had a good sit down talk with him. Just wanted to get the feel of what's going on uh, in the riding he represents and kind of East Hans as a whole before summer comes because summer's a busy time with lots of festivals and stuff and their schedules kind of fill up and he kind of wanted to know if there's anything ahead of the way and uh, it was, that was a very good meeting. Also got a chance to talk with the school principal at Uniac District School. Uh, and she, she relayed to me that uh, East Hance already has their bookings in for the fall for programming. And it's very good that we got those bookings in and kudos to staff for that because they're already at capacity and now turning away groups for space and, and use of the facility. So uh, glad that we got the programming in there and that's being able to be done. To, oh, also attended the library board AGM um, with Councillor Mitchell. And uh, I guess I'm his, I'm his first first up if he doesn't show up now, uh, to, uh, to 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 chair a meeting. I have two two things coming up. The first ones I will do is is a motion, and this uh, is in relation to the uh, short line Windsor to Hansport rail line that runs through Mount Uniac. And the motion is, council to direct staff to write a letter to the Honorable Kim Maslin, Minister of the Nova Scotia Department of Public Works expressing council's desire for an expedious proclamation of Bill 236 or intervention by the province declaring the windsor Hansport Railway no longer have control and interest in the former short line rail. I so move. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Questions. Questions been called. And the motion has passed unanimously. Thank you, Council. This has been an ongoing issue for over six years, and we're still waiting to get a response uh, from the provincial department. Hopefully, um, we'll we'll get one. The the last thing I have is um, to staff uh, around regulations. I don't know if uh, it's only been passed in the last day or so. Halifax recently passed a regulation for mobile parks and service delivery of water and things to, to the residents and, a, and an upholding of a new standard. And their standard must meet the same drinking standards as a water utility. Uh, a, little, a little early to, to have that uh, looked at, but I'm just kind of giving a heads up that uh, there will be a motion probably coming later on to look at that and in more detail. I don't know if it's been fully published and we have full access to that yet, but in the future, because I believe the mobile parks or, or shared condominium parks that we have throughout East Hance deserve to have viable drinking water that's tested on a random basis. No longer you're notified before three days in advance before they're going to test your water. Um, there's, I know for sure the park in Mount Uniac, people are replacing their hot water heater 
every year, every second year. Uh, the water's brown half the time, and uh, it's it's not good. Those people deserve to have clean clean drinking water, as does everybody in Canada. So that's just kind of a little forewarning for for, for staff that that just came out from Halifax, and it's uh, something that I think we should look into possibly in the future. And that's it for me. Oh, sorry, almost it for me. Last thing, uh, tomorrow I'll be attending the graduation ceremonies in Windsor uh, at Avenue High School, but I want to wish all the graduates uh, who are leaving their elementary schools to junior highs, junior highs to high schools, mm -hmm. and high schools on to university or career path in life, all the best and wishing them for a safe summer. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Madam Warden. I was gonna, I wasn't gonna mention it, but uh, probably I should. Uh, I want to share with you a, a story that uh, my own nephew that lost his daughter like in October, four years old, and after staying at home for a few months, he decided to buy her favorite restaurant at in Ten Thailand. And when the fire started, he went there with his two kids and his wife, and they stayed there for a week or so, cooking 250 meals every day instead of sitting home. So I'm very proud of him. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mitchell. <clears throat> yes, through, thank you, Madam Warden. Through you to staff, it has to deal with the pickup times for recyclables on the Garbage uh, pick up to the waste today, which would be the garbage, was around 11 a.m. And the recyclables were picked up between 1.55 and 2. I watched the truck go by. Is that going to be standard pickup times? Because the neighbor's <coughs> garbage next door was torn apart by the crows by 8 o'clock. So I'm just a, just a question that I can answer them if they're putting out for 7 and they're not getting picked up for four or six hours later, is, is there an advantage to them to putting out later? Some cover, but some don't. All right, through Madam Warden, um, residents should have their their material out first thing in the morning. Um, that That is the messaging. There is no, um, we don't suggest times. The routing can't be guaranteed to be consistent from time to time. They're separate trucks. Uh, I would suggest if there's birds picking apart your garbage bags, there's an opportunity to soar better. Um, that's what's going on there. Um, the food goes in the green bin, um, rinse your waste the best you can, and there's gonna be odds and sods, but uh, it shouldn't be getting picked apart like that. The uh, um, We have a new hauler. Uh, they, they were a little long, finishing routes in the first month. Uh, their service delivery drastically improved in, in, in uh, the second month, and we're looking to, to see the, the data for month three here soon to see if they're, they're uh, uh, improving a, more so. We, uh, our calls have gone down on questions from residents uh, from the first month to the second month. We're hoping that's gonna be the third, um, and they're figuring it out. So I would expect some inconsistencies on, on collection. They're using different multiple trucks for collection. So one truck might not pick up all your materials and that's gonna be standard in practice because they're trying to find ways to do the whole routes as a whole as quickly as possible. Material out, first thing in the morning, have it separated well. And, that's, and also if you're looking for specific tips, contact staff, and they can triage. We have some amazing staff members in solid waste that know all the best tricks. Um, so, so that one-on-one -on -one conversation between a resident and uh, um, either uh, our manager of solid waste or someone in the scale house, they, they, this is what they do. They, they've, they've heard it all, they've seen it all, they, they know what to do. So, so reach out, call the staff, encourage folks to call the staff. There's, there's no perfect time to put your material out. And I, I, uh, I've battled with the birds myself in the past and, and uh, the team's helped me find the way forward. So uh, I've, I've never had an issue since. So there, there are ways forward. Are the pickup times gonna get better? Through, 
Madam Ward, the better, it, it depends. So, so better as in complete by the end of the day at a reasonable business hour is the goal. Uh, getting picked up first thing in the morning, that's not something we guarantee anyone because the roots are what they are and the, and, and the, you may be first one week and you may not be the first the next week, uh, depending on what trucks are available, what breakdowns <laughs> may happen. Um, we, ju we just can't commit to that from a service level. It's just the day of. They are encouraged to call stop, bud. Absolutely. My Absolutely. Phone, my call. phone number seems to be closer <laughs> yep. for call. some reason. And it's, it seems to be the same, the same resin that has garbage torn apart. Yeah. We, through Madam Moore, uh, staff want to help. We want to help people figure out their sorting. Um, so so that, that, that's a call we would welcome. Okay. Thank you. I'll pass that along. Thank you. I would just make one quick note, but I did miss an event. I did attend uh, Hans North Leadership Awards on June the 13th, where I presented the Municipal Leadership Award to Mallory Graham, one of a number of awards the young lady received that evening, and it was greatly appreciated. Now, folks, we're at the hour of 1027. We do have an in-camera session for a contractual issue still on the agenda. Um, what is your wish? Do we stay and do that tonight, or do we come back tomorrow night? Okay, I'm going to ask for a show of hands for those who want to stay tonight. And not? I can't stay, so I'll be taking off. Okay, that's the rhino. I can't stay, so. Okay. So the majority would like to finish tonight. Okay. Majority rules. All right, I would be looking for a motion to move in camera. Seconded. 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 Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary, motion is carried. We will give staff some time to... Uh,
Are we ready to roll? Okay, folks, uh, I would report that we met in camera to discuss a contractual issue. Out of those discussions, we have one motion coming forward. Councillor Tingley. Uh, I'll move that Council approve an addition 100,000 to Project 22023 Gap Roads Project 2, which includes additional traffic calming on Boyd Avenue to be funded from the contingency reserve. Seconded, Seconded by Councillor Hebb. Is there any discussion on the motion? Question. Question's been called. And the motion is passed unanimously. Well, that concludes the business on our agenda tonight. Yeah. It's been a, quite a marathon session. And I don't have my agenda in front of me anymore. Okay. I would now be looking for a motion to set the time and the date of the next council meeting, July the 18th, 2023, regular meeting of council policy in Cameron, July 26th, regular meeting of council, and July the 27th, 2023, for the public hearing. Moved, Moved by Councillor Hebb. Second. Seconded by Deputy Warden. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary, motion is carried. I would now be looking for a motion to adjourn. Mm -hmm. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Contrary, motion carried. We are adjourned. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.